Hello everybody, this is the coronary blood flow, coronary artery disease, cardiac assessment, and cardiac surgery lecture um, as part of your 732. As I've mentioned in the class, you are going to have a more in-depth cardiovascular course that will start in the fall, uh, which will give you everything you wanted to know about the cardiovascular uh, system but what are afraid to ask and maybe then some but what the purpose is for this particular lecture is really to give you an overview um, and also prepare you for beginning your heart rotations which will probably be now because of the COVID-19 delayed until the fall okay so we have got quite a few lectures to go, our slides to go over, and I hope that you enjoy this. Now, what we are going to talk about is anatomy and physiology of the coronary circulation. And so some of this we actually talked about in 7.30. You see the aortic arch that comes up the ascending aorta and then the aortic arch. And right off of that is the brachiocephalic or innominant artery that we've talked about in 730, as well as the left common carotid artery, which is next, and then the left subclavian artery. Um, you also see the four chambers of the heart and where they're located, the superior and inferior vena cavas, um, the pulmonary artery as well. And then you can see um, in here the right coronary artery and in the art, uh, atrioventricular groove, the left um, coronary artery in the left arterioventricular groove, and then the anterior cardiac veins, the marginal artery, uh, the small cardiac vein, and then there are branches, as you know, of the left coronary artery, the circumflex is one, and the left anterior descending artery is the other. Now, our next slide primarily is going to be talking about um, coronary circulation and really just the physiology of it and where it occurs. So myocardial blood supply and the reason that we talk about coronary arteries and, and that it is so important, important that they stay patent is that they are the primary blood supply for the myocardium. Now, blood flows from epicardial to endocardial, so from you know, out to in. Um, blood returns to the right atrium after it perfuses the myocardium, and that comes from the coronary sinus and the anterior cardiac veins, which you saw um, on our previous diagram. Also, um, the anterior cardiac veins flow directly into the right atrium as well. So a small amount of blood returns directly into the heart chambers via the Fabesian veins. And then our resting coronary, also resting coronary blood flow is approximately 225 to 250 milliliters per minute on average. Um, another great thing about our coronary circulation is in the young, healthy individual, and young is a term uh, used rather loosely, um, cardiac output can increase four to seven times with strenuous exercise. Um, and, and patients who exercise and are relatively healthy, this um, they can, even if they're uh, you know, in the, some of the older age groups, then they also can increase their cardiac output with strenuous exercise. So now let's look at the um, is, um, let me go back for a minute. Um, So the left coronary artery normally supplies, I can't get it to go back, so I apologize, but it normally supplies um, the left um, atrium, most of the int uh, interventricular septum, and the septal anterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. So it really supplies the majority uh, of the heart. Um, the left main coronary artery, as you could see from the other diagram, is really has a very short little segment right after its takeoff that's known as the widowmaker. And the reason is because if you were to get a high-grade stenosis um, in that area, 
of the vessel or a high grade of plaque, then that puts almost the entire left side of the heart at risk for uh, ischemia and then infarction. And so we know that um, because of that, any type, uh, any time uh, an individual has a lesion, a high grade lesion in that area, generally surgery is going to proceed for them right away. And in addition, it is, uh, they're also, usually when they're diagnosed, they're gonna stay in the hospital until uh, surgery can be scheduled. And it's usually scheduled as soon as possible. Now, also shortly after that left main artery um, and that Widowmaker uh, comes out, it is going to also bifurcate into the left anterior descending artery and the circumflex artery. Those are the two major branches of the left coronary artery. The left um, anterior descending artery supplies the septum and anterior wall, and the circumflex supplies the lateral wall. So you see that's almost the entire left side of the heart between all those structures. Now, in the left dominant circulation, the circumflex is going to wrap around the AV group and then continue down as the posterior descending artery. And remember, in the posterior descending artery, that's only, uh, I mean, in the left dominant um, group, only 15% of the population, they, uh, their posterior descending artery is actually a branch of the left coronary artery. And so, as it continues down as the posterior descending artery, it supplies most of the posterior septum and inferior wall. Now, the arterial supply to the SA node can be derived from either the right coronary artery or the left anterior descending artery, 60% usually for the right coronary and 40% of the left anterior descending. The AV node is usually supplied by the right coronary artery about 85 to 95% and then less often there's a contribution by the circumflex 10 to 15%. There are two areas that have um, in the heart that have a dual blood supply. One of these is the bundle of Hiss. The bundle of Hiss has this dual supply that's derived from the posterior descending artery and the LAD and then the other one that has a dual blood supply and this these are these are things that you probably will see again on an examination. The anterior papillary muscle of the mitral valve has a dual blood supply and it is fed by diagonal branches of the left anterior descending um, artery and the marginal branches of the circumflex. And again, since I can't go back, I can't show you, but the left anterior descending has diagonal branches and it has from one to four, whereas the circumflex artery has obtuse marginal branches, and that's usually one to three, and those are identified during cath data. So when you're looking at patients who are to undergo um, coronary artery bypass graft, you need to know what and, and make yourself aware of what the lesions are um, in in those branches as well as the main arteries. And usually the designation will be like LAD1, you know, whatever, um, however much if there's a, um, if there is a like 15%, LAD, you know, it'll be D2, D3. And then the same thing with the circumflex, it'll have its piece and then OM1, OM2. So again, those things to look at. Now, so we know that are two areas of the heart that have a dual blood supply, bundle of Hiss, and the anterior papillary muscle of the mitral valve. Now, the posterior papillary muscle of the mitral valve is usually supplied only by the PDA, the um, posterior descending artery. So it is much more vulnerable to ischemic dysfunction than these other two supplies that have a dual supply. Now, we're going to look at this slide, which is determinants of coronary perfusion. And we know that during contraction, the pressures in the left ventricle, we're talking about intramyocardial pressures, are very similar to the systemic arterial pressure. And the force of the contraction of the left ventricle is so strong 
that it almost completely occludes the intramyocardial part of the coronary arteries. When this occurs, blood flow may transiently reverse in these epicardial vessels that are close to that. And even during the latter part of diastole, the left ventricular pressure eventually exceeds that of the right atrial pressure. Now, coronary uh, perfusion is different from other organs because instead of being continuous, it is intermittent. We know that the left ventricle is perfused during diastole, and then the right ventricle is actually um, perfused during both systole and diastole. Okay. Um, and so one of the things to think about then when we're thinking about coronary perfusion pressure is that it is really aortic diastolic pressure minus uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Okay, another thing is that we'll talk about is that arterial diastolic pressure is more important than mean arterial pressure as a determinant of myocardial blood flow. So decreases in aortic pressure or increases in ventricular end diastolic pressure, because that's what we talked about was coronary perfusion pressure, those are the two determinants, can definitely reduce coronary perfusion pressure. Other things that can um, decrease coronary perfusion are increases in heart rate. And the reason is because, as we know, coronary arteries are primarily um, perfused during diastole. And so increases in heart rate decrease the coronary perfusion because of the really disproportionate reduction in diastolic time as heart rate increases. And so the endocardium then tends to be more vulnerable to ischemia during decreases in coronary perfusion pressure because it's subjected to the greatest intramural pressures during systole. And if you don't know what um, intramural is, it's really just the pressure uh, within the organ itself. Well, I won't think of So when we look at control of coronary blood flow, we need to be thinking about it really in terms of myocardial metabolic demand because coronary blood flow does parallel myocardial metabolic demand. Remember we said in a few slides earlier um, is that coronary blood flow is approximately 225 to 250 milliliters per minute at rest. And so there are, there are other influences that um, also determine coronary blood flow. One is hypoxia that causes coronary vasodilatation. And then there are also autonomic influences that are generally weak, but still do have a tendency to affect um, the coronary blood flow. For example, we know that the coronary arteries both have alpha-1 and beta adrenergic receptors. This is one of the reasons why patients are prescribed these types of medications, alpha and beta either blockers or um, agonist type medications that can control various issues in the heart. We also know that these alpha-1 receptors are primarily located on the larger epicardial vessels and the beta-2 receptors are mainly found on the smaller subendocardial vessels and the smaller intramuscular vessels. Now, sympathetic stimulation generally increases myocardial blood flow because of an increase in metabolic demand, and we said that the coronary blood flow does parallel that of myocardial metabolic demand. And again, also because during sympathetic stimulation, there is a predominance of beta-2 receptor activation. Now, parasympathetic effects on the coronary vasculature are usually pretty minor, and if anything, are weakly vasodilatory. So we know that the heart 
regulates its own blood flow, just like the um, the uh, cerebral autumn regulation, you know, regulated blood flow as well. Between perfusion pressures of 50 to 120 millimeters of mercury. And so um, beyond this 50 to 120 millimeter of mercury range, um, blood flow becomes increasingly pressure dependent and increased demand causes a decreased resistance in the coronary arteries. Next, we're going to talk about myocardial oxygen demand. And so you look at the factors that um, have to, to do with supply, and you have to you look at the ones that have to do with demand, and then you know that we have to create a very fine balance between these two um, so that our heart is performing optimally. And so coronary blood flow is very tightly coupled with, coronary, with the oxygen demand of the heart. And that's very necessary because the heart has a very high basal oxygen consumption rate. It's eight to 10 milliliters of oxygen per minute per 100 grams. It also has the highest um, arterial um, venous difference of a major organ. So the arterial venous difference equals really the extraction of oxygen from the blood. That's what we're talking about. Okay, and just for point of reference, the brain has an oxygen, oxygen consumption rate of three, the kidney five milliliters per, um, uh, per minute, uh, oxygen per minute per 100 grams. So you see that the heart really has a very high uh, oxygen consumption rate. Now in non-diseased coronary vessels, whenever cardiac activity and oxygen consumption increases, there's usually an increase in coronary blood flow, and that's nearly proportionate to the increase in oxygen consumption. That's not usually a problem unless someone has an issue with their heart where they can't increase that. So what happens is their demand is much greater than their supply. They're out of balance, and then they have major issues. So usually um, there has to be a, a, a really good autoregulatory balance um, so that there's normal coronary blood flow um, you know, during these changes. And as I said, this is autoregulated. So usually autoregulated <clears throat> so that there is a balance um, until the heart can no longer compensate. Hello. 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 What's up? Hey. What's up? Mecklenburg and Pitt County are under a shelter in order. That's orders. what I heard. I didn't know that Pitt County had that many cases. Last they night. don't. They're what? just being proactive. Yeah. They didn't have that many last night. No, nope, but they're just they're just taking care of the county. Yeah. So in terms of supply versus demand. The myocardial oxygen demand is usually the most important determinant of myocardial blood flow. And there are relative contributions to oxygen requirements that include our basal requirements, um, about 20%. Electrical activity is about 1% of the heart's work. Volume work of the heart is about 15%. And pressure work takes up all the rest. So about 64% of the actual work of the heart is related to pressure work. So that's really what um, drives the myocardial oxygen um, demand. Now we know that the myocardium cannot compensate for reduction in blood flow by re, um, extracting it from hemoglobin. And the reason is that the myocardium usually extracts already 65 to 80% of the oxygen in the arterial blood compared with 25% on most of the other tissues. So, and the coronary sinus oxygen saturation is usually 30%. So you can see just by that, 
that it extracts, the myocardium extracts nearly all the oxygen that is delivered to it anyway. So as a result, the myocardium then is not able to compensate for reductions in blood flow by extracting more oxygen from hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin. So any increase then in myocardial metabolic demand has to be met by an increase in coronary blood flow. That's the only way that it's going to get any more. So when we look at oxygen myocardial supply versus um, demand, we are actually looking um, at several things. First of all, factors that contribute to supply are oxygen delivery, hemoglobin, oxygen carrying capacity, and coronary blood flow. And then demand, it's heart rate, wall tension, contractility, and that is all, those are all the factors that are really must be balanced so that there's not really an, an overabundance of demand on the heart. So let's look at the factors that contribute to myocardial oxygen supply. We know that myocardial oxygen content is certainly one and that the two things underneath that are arterial oxygen tension and hemoglobin concentration. There's also coronary perfusion pressure, which consists of our aortic diastolic blood pressure and the ventricular end diastolic pressure. And then heart rate, which really is important because of diastolic time, the coronaries, as we said, perfuse during diastole. And then coronary vessel diameter. Remember that um, coronary blood flow is directly proportional to coronary perfusion pressure and inversely proportional to resistance. So as you just learned, any increases in myocardial metabolic demand must be met by an increase in coronary blood flow. And then factors that contribute to the demand, again, are heart rate, basal requirements of the heart, wall tension, and we're talking about preload and afterload. Preload is <clears throat> really defined as the initial stretching of the cardiac myocytes prior to contraction. And it's related to muscle sarcomere length. Um, and because the sarcomere length can't be determined in the intact heart, other indices uh, of preload are usually used, such as ventricular end diastolic volume or pressure. And so a short definition of preload, when we think about it, is really the, in, the initial stretch of the ventricle at end diastole. And then after load, we know, really can be thought of as a load or resistance that the heart must eject blood against. It's closely related to the aortic pressure, and it's also referred to as ventricular wall stress. And then there is contractility, and we and by that, we know that the heart rate and to a lesser extent, the ventricular end diastolic pressure really are the most important determinants of both supply and demand. So talking about preload and afterload, we just said that preload is the feeling pressure of the heart at the end of diastole. And again, it can be defined as the initial stretch of the cardiac myocytes prior to contraction. It's related to, again, muscle sarcomere length, but because sarcomere length can't be determined in the alive human for obvious re reasons, other indicators such as ventricular end diastolic volume or pressure are used also. Also because the left atrial pressure at the end of diastole is a reflection of left ventricular end diastolic pressure it can also be used to determine the preload. In congenital hearts, if you recall, because there's not the availability of a PA catheter that's small enough to measure that, and because left atrial pressure can be an indicator of preload as well, it's often used to as an indicator for preload 
as well as function. So the greater the preload, the greater the volume of blood in the heart at the end of diastole. It's like blowing up a balloon. The more pressure that's applied, the bigger it will get. Now, afterload, on the other hand, is pressure against which the heart must work to eject blood during systole. The lower the afterload, the more blood the heart will eject with each contraction. And we know that because if there's an increase in afterload, then that also increases the workload of the heart. So we know that any kind of changes will either raise or lower the Starling curve. We're gonna talk about the Starling curve um, in just a minute and that relates to stroke volume um, and again, left atrial pressure. The effect of afterload on stroke volume is really due to the fact that the ma maximum pressure that the heart can develop is smaller at lower ventricular volumes, which means if the systolic pressure is lower, the heart will be able to contract to a smaller volume at the end of systole. This will result in improved stroke volume. Now the opposite when we look at it that way. If the systolic pressure is higher, the heart is going to be unable to contract to a small a volume at the end of systole and the stroke volume index will be decreased. And of course, these are concepts that we're gonna go over in more detail a bit in this lecture, but certainly next semester as well in the fall. So as I mentioned, Starling's Law of the Heart really states that the heart will eject a greater stroke volume if it is filled to a greater volume at the end of diastole. The volume of the heart at end diastole is related to the filling pressure of the heart, which we know to be preload, which is determined by the left atrial pressure. Starling's law is usually plotted as a relationship of stroke volume index to left atrial pressure. The relationship is modified by contractility and afterload. Stroke volume then equals the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle during one cardiac cycle or contraction. So when we talk about Frank Starling or the Starling law or the Frank Starling mechanism, again, we're really talking about um, the ability of the heart to change its force of contraction and therefore change its stroke volume in response to changes in venous return. There's no single Frank Starling curve on which the ventricle operates. Instead, there's really a family of curves that you can see here, each of which is defined by afterload and the inotropic, inotropic state of the heart. So in this particular figure, you will see multiple curves. The red dashed curve represents a normal ventricular Frank Starling curve. Increasing afterload or decreasing inotropy shifts the curve down and to the right. So increasing afterload or decreasing inotropy, increasing afterload or decreasing inotropy shifts the curve down and to the right which means that at a given LVEDP, depressing the curve will result in a lower stroke volume. In contrast, decreasing afterload and increasing inotropy shifts the curve up and to the left, which means that at a given LVEDP, shifting the Frank Starling curve up and to the left will result in a greater stroke volume at a given LVEDP. Now, at a given state of ventricular inotropy and afterload, the ventricle responds to changes in venous return and ventricular filling based on the unique curve for those conditions. So just talking about all of this and summarizing it. Changes in venous return are gonna cause the ventricle to move up or down along a single Frank Starling curve. However, the slope of that curve is defined by the existing conditions of afterload and inotropy. 
And we know that these Frank Starling curves show how changes in ventricular preload lead to changes in stroke volume. And again, if you recall, our definition of stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one cardiac cycle. This type of graphical representation doesn't really show, though, changes in venous return, uh, the effect of end uh, and its effect on end diastolic and end systolic volumes. And so in order to really describe ventricular function, um, it's better to do it also in association with pressure volume diagrams. The pressure volume diagrams are going to be discussed in depth during your 753 fall cardiovascular course. <clears throat> so as a result, I'm not going to spend time on that here. It is certainly a very in-depth concept and will be you'll be better served for us to wait until next or the fall semester. So let's look at some of the conditions that might cause a, an individual to come for valvular heart surgery. We know that valve uh, mitral stenosis is characterized by mechanical obstruction to left ventricular diastolic filling due to the progressive decrease in the size of the mitral valve orifice. Remember, stenosis is narrowing of the mitral valve orifice. Mitral stenosis is characterized by mechanical obstruction to left ventricular diastolic filling due to the progressive decrease in the size of the mitral valve orifice. It prevents <clears throat> the left atrium from emptying, leading to increased left atrial and pulmonary artery pressures. It prevents the left ventricle from being full, so left ventricular emptying is decreased, which leads to a decrease in stroke volume and cardiac output. What we want to do is avoid increases in heart rate, blood pressure, and pulmonary vascular resistance, as well as decreases in blood pressure. <clears throat> it's important to maintain perfusion pressure or preload and avoid hypoxia, hypercarbia, and hyperthermia. Now, in terms of tachycardia, we know that we don't want that, so we would treat that with beta blockers, sometimes uh, digoxin, cardioversion, if that was what was needed, and adenosine. For hypertension, we want to increase anesthetic depth. For pulmonary hypertension, we would treat it with nitric oxide and sildenafil. Hypotension would be phenylephrine. And hyperthermia, usually some sort of antipyrexic. Mitral regurgitation, also known as mitral insufficiency or mitral incompetence, is really a disorder of the heart where the mitral valve does not close properly when the left ventricle contracts. And so what happens as a result is that blood backs up or is regurgitated back into the left atrium. It's the most common form of valvular heart disease. Mitral regurg occurs when the mitral valve does not close properly when the left ventricle contracts. So again, blood backs up into the left atrium. We also know that, <clears throat> as I said, it is the most common form of valvular heart disease. Severe congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema can occur as a result of mitral regurg. Also, dyspnea on exertion and fatigue are often signs of left ventricular dysfunction. So usually that's an indicator that there is some sort of uh, mitral regurgitation. What we want is to keep the heart full, fast, forward. In other words, avoid bradycardia and increases in, pul in pulmonary vascular resistance as well as
you know, allowing enough blood to go actually into the flow, actually into the heart. Next, we'll look at aortic valve stenosis. And you see from the diagram that there's a healthy aortic valve open and closed. And then you see what it looks like when there is a, an unhealthy aortic valve, such as aortic valve stenosis, when it's open and closed. We know that there is narrowing of this aortic valve, which you can see in this diagram in both of these open and closed states, that causes obstruction of left ventricular outflow. It decreases cardiac output and cardiac compliance, and it increases LVEDP. So aortic stenosis is just narrowing of the aortic valve, and that causes obstruction of left ventricular outflow, a decreased cardiac output, and cardiac compliance, as well as an increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure. It also causes an increase in myocardial oxygen demand, and they have a significant risk for cardiac morbidity perioperatively. What you want to do in these patients is avoid hypotension and decreases in um, systemic vascular resistance. You want to maintain those because they need uh, atrial kick also, so we want a normal sinus rhythm, and they need an adequate preload. What happens many times is people get into trouble and allow these patients to get hypotensive. They don't tolerate anesthetic gas as well. They also don't tolerate regional anesthesia with spinals where they're going to have a decrease in SVR. So it doesn't mean that <clears throat> you couldn't do a lower spinal or you couldn't do some sort of peripheral block, like I'm saying a caudal block or something like that, but you would really, really, really want to be careful than if you were to do regional blocks because you don't want to have a decrease in SVR. Some texts say that they are contraindicated. So it is probably best that you think about it as they are contraindicated, but know that sometimes patients will have some of these types of blocks. Aortic valve regurgitation is also known as aortic insufficiency. And it is the failure of the aortic valve to close tightly, which means that there is backflow of blood into the ventricle. Aortic insufficiency occurs when there are abnormalities in the aortic valve leaflets that produce regurgitant flow into the left ventricle after the valve itself has closed. This causes increased LVEDP and an increased left atrial pressure. It also causes volume and pressure overload of the left ventricle. So what you would want to do in the management of patients that have aortic insufficiency is to avoid sudden decreases in heart rate, also avoid increases in SVR and myocardial depression. So basically you want to maintain a normal to increased heart rate, a normal to slightly reduced SVR, and a normal sinus rhythm and contractility. It's important that they don't have decreases in heart, in heart rate because again, that all adds to the regurgitant flow. Now, the next we're going to thing that we're gonna talk about is tricuspid stenosis. And tricuspid stenosis is really just narrowing or stiffening of the opening in the, in the valve. With tricuspid stenosis, you rarely see this as an isolated type of valvular lesion. Usually patients don't come in, in other words, solely to have their tricuspid valve fixed. So when we talk about it, the primary cause of tricuspid stenosis is rheumatic valvulitis. That's usually what you will see. Other causes of tricuspid stenosis are uh, those that have systemic lupus erythematosus, endocardial fibroelastosis, and carcinoid syndrome. So you can certainly see that. Um, some of the causes also of primary cuspid, um, tricuspid stenosis are the valve uh, disease uh, is itself, trauma, birth defects, and damage. When tricuspid valve stenosis occurs, just as a standalone thing, usually not associated 
with anything uh, other type of disease, then it will manifest with signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure, such as hepatomegaly, hepatic dysfunction, ascites, edema, jugular venous distension, and also giant A waves that would be seen on a CVP tracing. Also, with the next thing that we'll talk about is tricuspid uh, valve regurgitation. And again, basically what that is, is leakage of the tricuspid valve that allows the blood to flow backwards. The incidence in the United States is pretty small, 0.9%. Um, <clears throat> and again, there are, have been certain medications in the past that have caused tricuspid regurg. The most common cause is left-sided heart failure, but other causes include rheumatic heart disease, infection and trauma. Um, a mild form may be detected in about really greater than 90% of the normal population, but symptoms would uh, include peripheral edema of the ankles, abdominal distension, um, and signs of fatigue. It's usually uh, diagnosed by echocardiogram and cardiac cath. So some of the things to ask are what would you see, uh, what would be clinically significant with tricuspid regurgitation? So isolated tricuspid regurgitation is most frequently seen in association with drug abuse, endocarditis, or chest trauma. It's more commonly associated with other cardiac abnormalities, usually such as end-stage aortic or mitral valve disease. And again, it's also most commonly due to dilation of the right ventricle from the pulmonary hypertension that's associated with chronic right ventricular failure. But as we said, carcinoid syndrome may also produce isolated tricuspid regurg, and a congenital cause of that is Epstein's anomaly, which is the downward displacement of the valve because of abnormal attachment of the valve leaflets. Tricuspid regurgitation is generally well tolerated because the right ventricle can compensate for a volume overload, but not a pressure overload. Most symptoms of tricuspid regurg are directly related to an increase in the afterload of the right ventricle. And a common heart rhythm that was found in patients that have tricuspid regurg is atrial fibrillation. And what we would see on the CVP tracing would be giant V waves. Now, the next disease that we're going to talk about of the of the valvular um, of the heart valves is pulmonary stenosis. And pulmonary stenosis, basically, you can see here a normal pulmonary valve and a stenosed pulmonary valve. So the opening is just greatly narrowed. It is a dynamic or fixed obstruction to flow from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. And as a result, it's usually diagnosed in childhood um, because resistance to blood flow causes right ventricular hypertrophy. If the right ventricular failure develops, usually what you'll see also is a right atrial pressure increase and this may result in reopening of the foramen ovale, where there is shunted, shunting of unoxygenated blood into the left atrium and systemic cyanosis. Now, if pulmonary stenosis is severe, congestive heart failure occurs, and systemic venous engorgement will be noted. Uh, an associated defect, such as a patent ductus arteriosus, partially compensates for the obstruction by shunting blood from the aorta to the, to the pulmonary artery and into the lungs. And again, that's why a lot of this is diagnosed in childhood. They, these symptoms would be picked up. Um, the treatment of choice is, again, while someone is young, a child, is a percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty that is done when a resting peak gradient is seen um, on, and it usually is done in the cath lab. It also is, this um, lesion is usually due to isolated valvular obstruction 
but it may be due to subvalvular or supravalvular obstruction as well. And it also can occur with more complicated genital, congenital heart disorders. Next, we'll talk about pulmonary regurgitation. And you can see a diagram here of a normal pulmonary valve versus a regurgitant Pulmonic regurgitation is basically the backward flow of blood from the pulmonary artery through the pulmonary valve and then into the right ventricle of the heart during diastole. It is usually diagnosed in childhood as a result of a congenital heart defect. While a small amount of pulmonary regurgitation may occur in healthy individuals, it's usually detectable only by an EKG and is harmless. So mild cases usually don't cause any symptoms. Any noticeable symptoms are caused by an underlying medical condition usually rather than the regurgitation itself. Now the more severe regurgitation may contribute to right ventricular hypertrophy and in later stages to right heart failure. What you would also see is a decrescendo murmur that will sometimes be identified early in diastole. It's heard best over the left lower sternal border. Causes will include pulmonary hypertension, endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, congenital absence or disease of the valve, um, tetralogy of Fallot and carcinoid syndrome are two types of uh, medical issues that are often associated with it, as well as there are some congestive abnormality, abnormalities. Um, you can also see uh, in some of these that they're asymptomatic, as we mentioned, so there's no treatment required. But those that have symptoms are usually either treated medically and may then possibly move on to having to be surgically treated from there. Now we're going to talk about coronary artery disease. And we know that this is a disease that many Americans and many others across the world um, develop. You can see a normal artery here, a normal coronary artery, and then a coronary artery that is diseased. So you see the amount of flow that is reduced as a result of plaque. Things that lead to it are smoking, hypertension, hypercholesteremia, and diabetes mellitus, and of course, a sedentary lifestyle. Now let's talk a bit about atherosclerosis because that's really the main cause of coronary artery disease. It's the most common cause as well. This is atherosclerosis is a slow progressive vascular disease. It actually can start as early as childhood and is characterized by the accumulation of fatty deposits along the innermost layer of the arteries known as plaque. So this plaque is are actually deposits of smooth muscle cells, fatty substances, cholesterol, calcium, and cellular waste products. What you see on that towel, on the green towel, is a piece of plaque that came out of a carotid artery, but if you were to remove it from a coronary artery, you would see this same sort of um, fatty substance um, and smooth muscle cell type of of plaque material. Now we're going to talk about um, CAD or atherosclerotic heart disease and some of the signs and symptoms and risk factors. So we know that this is characterized by narrowing of epicardial coronary vessels by atherosclerotic plaque, which we said is made up of muscle cells, um, cholesterol, etc. It is estimated that 11 million Americans have coronary artery disease, and these are just the ones that we know about. The leading risk factors are age, male gender, hypertension, and tobacco use. The other risk factors are diabetes mellitus, obesity, psychosocial characteristics such as a sedentary lifestyle, personality. It can also be a 
very high risk type of lifestyle with a lot of stress, and then a family history. Now, usually when patients have atherosclerotic heart disease, they are going to have some degree of chest discomfort. So we know that when there is normal blood flow to the heart, patients are usually asymptomatic. They can also have chronic stable exertional angia, angina, which is ischemia related to cell injury. This is usually temporary. And there are various stages of angina, angina which we're going to talk about. Um, it, can be very, it can be stable, it can be mild, and then when it develops into unstable, where there is ischemia and cell injury, and usually some sort of acute coronary syndrome is possible, um, then we know that patients usually are very symptomatic and are very much at risk for developing myocardial infarction, um, cell death, and then permanent damage. There's also a variant, Prince Metals angina, which is a vasospastic type of angina, and we're going to talk about that and the differences as well. So when we talk about angina, basically what we're talking about is the symptomatic manifestation of myocardial ischemia that is caused by an imbalance between what we were talking about before, our myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Patients may be asymptomatic, we talked about, until the vessel occlusion causes a decrease in the myocardial oxygen consumption because of lack of supply. So there's an imbalance. And so what you're left with is an aching, dull, or heavy chest pressure, which may radiate to the left jaw, left arm, left neck, or shoulder, or back. It often accompanies physical exertion or anxiety and emotional stress. It may be silent, which means there's no pain present at all. And, or you might have things like syn syncope, shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea on exertion, and dysrhythmias, but again, no pain. So a patient can actually uh, be asymptomatic until the vessel is occluded to the point where the um, MVO2 is diminished and unable to meet the demand even as much as up to 70% occlusion. So when you're looking at it in terms of the scale and grading it, generally there, are, there is um, a scale that's used called the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Grading Scale. And so class one is angina only during strenuous or prolonged physical activity. Class two, slight limitation with angina only during vigorous physical activity. Class three, symptoms with everyday living activities. So there's a moderate limitation there now. Class four, inability to perform any activity without angina or angina at rest. In other words, this individual has a severe limitation. These are the people that usually require frequent use of sublingual nitroglycerin. They may also Re, uh, require escalating doses of meds or the addition of meds to control their angina. They may also have congestive heart failure, um, have had a recent MI, have some left main coronary artery disease, which all significantly increase the patient's risk for ischemia and perioperative morbidity. It's usually diagnosed by EKG changes, hemodynamic changes, increases in the filling pressures or our PA pressures, our regional wall motion abnormalities, if you see those on an echocardiogram, through angiography and the patient history. And this is where we would ask the patient what type of exercise level they have and start being very specific. Are you able to go get your mail? Are you able to, to do housework? Do you get exhausted or are you able to walk to the refrigerator and those kind of things without getting winded? So there is 
stable um, category of angina as well as an unstable category of angina. What is stable angina? It's predictable chest pain that lasts a few minutes or less. It's relieved by rest or medication, and it's triggered often by physical exertion or emotional stress. And also it's characterized by no change in the precipitating factors, frequency of pain, and or duration of pain for greater than or equal to 60 days. How is it treated? Oxygen, rest, nitrates, beta blockers, and calcium channel, block, channel blockers. And remember, sometimes we call it demand ischemia because the demand is outweighing or imbalanced. Um, it's requiring more than what the supply is. But with stable, it is, has not yet gotten to the tipping point where there's cause there, uh, where you have ischemia and then uh, eventually infarction. Now with unstable angina, as I mentioned, the patient usually is going to have a progression of their symptoms. So they will have, and this becomes a supply ischemia as well. It may be related to a thrombus, but they are far more symptomatic. They will have chest pain at rest, um, they may also not be relieved um, from their pain uh, with nitroglycerin and require other. So remember, unstable angina is unpredictable chest pain that occurs unexpectedly even when at rest. It's produced with less than normal activity or it lasts for, for more prolonged periods than before. It's also called pre-infarction angina because it is an indication that patients' reserves are becoming further depleted and that they may be at risk for a myocardial infarction. It is treated with supportive therapy plus medications. And as we mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, this can be nitroglycerin um, as well as others, but they're not going to be getting the same kind of relief that they did previously. Also, thrombolytics are used to treat it. Cardiac catheterization with a possible angioplasty or stent placement. And these are the very patients that may indeed need to have uh, an intraaortic balloon inserted to help decrease the workload of their heart, but also to help augment coronary perfusion. This is again known as supply ischemia, and we might see patients that come for a coronary artery bypass graft that will be having crushing type chest pain. Um, so we may see these kind of patients come for emergency cabs. Now, also we've been talking about acute coronary occlusion and what can happen. We know that patients that have unstable angina are also prone for an acute coronary occlusion. And so what happens is that um, a person who already has underlying atherosclerotic coronary artery disease has plaque that breaks off it's either plaque or a clot that breaks off and occludes an artery. It almost never occurs in a patient with normal coronary circulation. And again, it can also recur, uh, occur not just from a thrombus, but also a muscle spasm. So what happens is the plaque um, can cause a local blood clot that's called a thrombus, and that then occludes the artery. The thrombus usually occurs where the plaque has broken through the endothelium and then it comes in direct contact with the flowing blood. So the plaque makes the surface of the vessels unsmooth and as a result, platelets are gonna sink down and adhere to it. Then fibrin is deposited and red blood cells come into it and become entrapped, which then forms a blood clot that grows until it occludes the vessel itself. Sometimes the clot breaks away from the plaque and it flows to a more peripheral branch of a coronary artery and that's known as an embolus. Now the problem is, is that the, it can cause a great degree of damage, but that degree of damage 
that's caused by the occlusion of the coronary artery or its branches is really determined by the degree of collateral circulation that has been established either before the occlusion or within minutes after the occlusion. With a myocardial infarction that occurs immediately after an acute coronary occlusion, what happens is that blood flow has stopped in the vessel beyond the occlusion, except for small amounts of collateral flow from surrounding vessels. So the area of heart muscle supplied by that artery receives either zero blood flow or flow that is so little that the function can't continue anyway. And so we call all of that a myocardial infarction. The causes of death after MI are usually decreased cardiac output, damming of blood in the pulmonary blood vessels, and this results in pulmonary edema, fibrillation of the heart, and rupture of the heart. Preoperative assessment is very important in this group of patients, um, as well as identification of the cardiac risk factors for morbidity and mortality. It's extremely important when we are preparing our care plan. For these patients. And so again, when we are talking about doing a preoperative cardiac assessment, we know that cardiovascular disease is a major cause of perioperative morbidity and mortality that's seen in our practice. Also that cardiovascular complications account for about 25 to 50% of death following non-cardiac surgery. We see patients that come in and have perioperative MIs. They have dysrhythmias, which can be life-threatening. Pulmonary um, embolus, um, congestive heart failure. They can also develop pulmonary edema, and then thromboembolus. Complications occur most commonly in patients that have pre-existing cardiac disease. But again, some of these, as we mentioned, um, that are the one of some of the worst ones are the ones that we talked about with MI dysrhythmias, et cetera. So there are some risk factors, some that are major and some intermediate and then some minor. So let's talk about the major ones because they truly are the most important. We know that patients that come in with unstable coronary syndromes, acute or recent MI, for example, um, and unstable or severe angina class three or four are certainly at a high risk. Those with decompensated heart failure, high risk. Significant arrhythmias, high risk. Severe valvular heart disease, high risk. Uncontrolled systemic hypertension, very high risk. And we know that hypertension in and of itself is a problem because it's a leading cause of death and disability in the Western world. And we know that long-standing uncontrolled hypertension accelerates atherosclerosis and other organ damage. So it's a major risk factor for cardiac, cerebral, renal, and vascular disease. We also know that there are intermediate risk factors, mild angina um, pectoris, classes one or two have an intermediate risk for morbidity and mortality. Those who've had a pre previous MI and have a history or of Q waves on EKG, those that have compensated or a history of congestive heart failure. Those that, are ha that have diabetes mellitus, particularly those who are insulin dependent diabetics, and then renal insufficiency. We also know that there are minor risks for morbidity and mortality, um, and these would be advanced age. Not everybody who is of advanced age has coronary artery disease or who has risk for having a heart attack. Um, but some of the things we look at would be abnormal EKG with left ventricular hypertrophy, a left bundle branch block, ST and T wave abnormalities, the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy and hypertension patients may also increase the risk of their cardiac mortality. Abnormal rhythm such as atrial fib and SVT are certainly 
um, risk factors, low functional capacity and cardiac reserve. Um, for example, unable to climb stairs, mow the grass, perform activities of daily living without pain. And then there is a history of a CVA or stroke, um, also hypertension. And we know that hypertension is a leading cause of death and disability because it is a major risk factor for all types of diseases, cardiac, cerebral, renal, and vascular disease. And again, you, they can also have aortic dissection, MI, congestive heart failure, again, stroke, chronic renal failure, etc. Now, it's important to get the data that we need for these patients prior to surgery, if possible. Some of them are going to come in as an emergency, and it may be that we're not able to get all the, all the information that we need right away. So we need a history and physical that is a very thorough one. It includes their current medications and when they take them. Also their exercise tolerance, cardiac cath data and other testing data, as well as a list of their current symptoms. Also a 12 lead EKG, an echo and a stress test really are some of the essential um, monitoring and tests that needed to be done. Vessels involved, we want to know. We also want to know their ejection fraction and their cardiac output. Again, an assessment of their activity of daily living in terms of mowing grass, cooking, walking to the mailbox, those kind of things. We want to know about their history of MI if they've had it. If it's less than 30 days, they're at the highest risk. If it's greater than 30 days, Again, their risk is going to be based on their signs and symptoms and their exercise tolerance. It used to be that if a patient had an MI, the cutoff for having surgery after that MI was six months. But currently the ideal weight is three months, but they could proceed after one month if there are no signs and symptoms and the patient has a good exercise tolerance. Now we know that when patients have an echo, it's important to, to know we really want to be looking for the report that talks about wall motion abnormalities, their valve competency, and the flow. What we want to know is if they have signs and symptoms of ischemia. Do they um, have, what is their level of symptoms? What type of control of their angina? Um, do they currently have? Is there associated disease like congestive heart failure or recent MI, uh, a left main coronary artery disease? We want to know a list of their medications and when last taken. Remember that the hallmark of ischemia is myocardial oxygen supply is decreased relative to demand. So the patient, again, has reserves that are being depleted even further. So their level of symptoms would be if they have a high grade angina at rest, that's a high grade angina. And then um, we want to know if they take medication, how many pills do they take if they take nitroglycerin? How many does it take before it starts to work? How long does it take? So they really need a very thorough history. Additional data that's needed prior to surgery is, of course, their height and weight, their vital signs, and their blood pressure. And we want to take it especially in both arms because we know that there can be problems where there's decreased uh, blood flow on one side versus the other. Patients that have coarctation of the aorta that's undetected may be one group of patients where there's going to be a difference in the blood pressure in, the both, in both of their arms. We want to look at their labs, especially in H&H, &H, platelets and chemistry. And again, when we're talking about chemistry, we were really focused on sodium, potassium, and glucose. We want to review their old anesthesia records, um, certainly their surgical and anesthetic history. 
And in urgent or emergent cases, you don't always have the luxury of obtaining the information that's most important. So you want to make sure that you really ask very focused questions and get the most pertinent information as possible in the shortest period of time. It's also important to know the indicators of poor left ventricular function because that generally will tell you what the course of their coronary artery disease and bypass, uh, I mean graft and bypass uh, run is going to look like. So poor left ventricular function is associated with EFs that are less than 40%. When they have a cardiac cath, they will be looking at an ejection fraction, so you would have a number for that. Also look at their resting left ventricular end diastolic pressure. If it's greater than 18 millimeters of mercury, that's an indicator that they have poor left ventricular function. If they have significantly um, abnormal left ventricular wall motion on their echo, that's an indicator of poor LV function. Sometimes when you look at their echo, you will hardly see the any beating of that heart, any movement of the left ventricular wall. Also, you want to look at um, their history of congestive heart failure, as well as a recent MI and severe valvular heart disease. Predictors for post cardiopulmonary bypass circulatory assistance, um, when we look at it preoperatively, would be left ventricular function that's less than 30%. End-stage myocardial impairment from severe valvular heart disease, especially regurgitation. Coronary artery disease, which can only partially be bypassed. So they may be able to bypass some segment, but not all. So they would still have a degree of obstruction to flow. Also, anticipated long cardiopulmonary bypass run some patients are going to present to us in a variety of fashions. Some are going to be in much better shape than others. Some will be emergencies and they will be crashing. And so we would have to do what we call crashing onto bypass, which means that they are going to frantically uh, be trying to open the chest, um, Put, you know, they, these patients may have a balloon pump in already, and then they're going to crash onto bypass as quickly as possible. Our patients will come to us, as I said, a variety of ways. So they're going to have documented coronary artery disease with or without symptoms of angina. They may have a recent MI, have had a recent MI, and have an urgent need for revascularization. They may have a, be a repeat cabbage or valve replacement um, from you know, several years ago or sometimes shorter than that. They may have failed attempts to reopen vessels in the cath lab, so they've tried to put stents in and they've been unsuccessful. Hemodynamically unstable or crashing patients may come from the cath lab for an emergent cabbage. Also, aortic insufficiency, aortic stenosis, mitral regurg, and mitral stenosis. It may be that, that these patients have gotten into trouble and not only have valvular heart issues, but may also have had to come for cardiac surgery um, for a cabbage and a valve replacement or an emergent valve replacement alone. Sometimes it's scheduled and they have varying degrees of this regurgitation and stenosis. So now we'll look at, at setup and monitoring equipment for these patients. And primarily we want, um, every hospital is going to have a standard way that they, they set up um, in terms of medications, their monitoring, their lines, etc. Each institution, for the most part, is going to have a cardiac guideline or cardiac manual that explains their basic setup. Wake Med has one, as well as Rex. Um, Cone Health doesn't have one, as uh, they may have a one sheet. 
but um, it would so of course it's not as extensive but they do have guidelines on how to do them so a standard setup is of course to have your routine airway supplies also they're going to have a triple line setup which means that you will be monitoring arterial lines CVP and PA catheter waveforms vasoactive drips again these definitely change from one institution to the next but nitroglycerin phenylephrine and sodium nitroperoxide are basic um, some basics are going to be levofed um, some are going to be epinephrine so as I said you're going to see a variety of medications used for your IV fluids generally it's lactated ringers they will have two peripheral IVs a vehicle and a VIP uh, port of their swan um, as well as they will have a uh, PA catheter that can do continuous cardiac output and con uh, cardiac index monitoring and then we will have emergency and induction drugs drawn up now I want to talk a little bit about running cardiac outputs because it's extremely important usually when we do continuous cardiac output monitoring that does not involve thermodilution but when patients come off of bypass and they have been off of continuous cardiac output monitoring it usually takes a period of time for the catheter to calibrate because they the patients have been at a very low temperature and so we will use the thermodilution method where the coils are in a bucket of ice and so it's very cold um, fluid that goes through so this is important to know if you have a low injectate volume let's say that you should have given or injected 10 milliliters and instead you inject five then that's going to overestimate the cardiac output in other words give you a higher reading than the patient actually has if the injectate is too warm then that is going to overestimate the cardiac output if there's a thrombus on the thermistor of the PA catheter overestimates if the catheter itself is partially wedged of the PA catheter it overestimates the cardiac output in terms of underestimating it excessive injectate volume so if you were supposed to have 10 and you had 15 if your injectate solutions are too cold it underestimates and to be honest with you many of the setups do not have temperature monitoring in them sometimes they do and so over the years I've wondered if those that do not have temperature monitoring in them if they were too cold and then caused an underestimation of the cardiac output and then unpredictable cardiac output is a right to left VSD if a patient had one um, also uh, a left to right VSD and then tricuspid regurgitation we also for line placement patients may come down without any oxygen oxygen because but because placing lines does place a stress on the patient's heart they need to have oxygen either by nasal cannula or mask if they come down without any oxygen then before we start doing anything to them we want to put oxygen on them we need to start two large bore IVs a 14 uh, or 16 gauge catheters if you can get to 14 gauge catheters those are preferred but it's better to have a um, 16 gauge that runs fantastically than a 14 gauge that doesn't run well at all now routine monitors as we've talked about EKG we're going to be looking at leads um, 2 and 6 a non-invasive blood pressure cuff a pulse oximeter the blood pressure cuff is going to be placed obviously on the opposite arm from the a line unless vessels are going to be harvested from the arm or unless they are going to use the sones approach rather than the femoral approach for catheter placement now um, in terms of other monitors fully catheter 
an oral gastric tube, arterial lines, CVP, and PA are standard. And also at some point the patient will have a transesophageal echocardiogram. Basic emergency medications will be atropine, usually two milligrams drawn up, ephedrine 50 milligrams, and remember how we draw that up? When it's in a 10 milligrams, I mean 10 milliliter syringe, then it's usually five milligrams per uh, milliliter. If it's in a five milliliter syringe, it's 10 milligrams per milliliter. Needs to be well marked. Lidocaine, 100 milligrams in a breast jet, and then two grams of calcium chloride. Usually we're going to be using heparin, four milligrams per kilogram. Um, and then induction agents, Atomidate or Propofol. Now, most people are going to use Propofol for almost every patient unless it is contraindicated. Most relaxants. Again, for induction, rocuronium is a pretreatment, succinylcholine or vecuronium. Um, you can do an induction entirely with rocuronium. You can do an induction entirely with vecuronium. Just remember that vecuronium if it is used as the for the induction um, muscle relaxant, then you are going to have to ventilate for a longer period of time because it would not be used for a rapid sequence induction or, uh, or to secure the airway quickly. And then for maintenance, uh, muscle relaxant, vecuronium or pancuronium. Pancuronium, as I mentioned before, was a really popular choice especially when we were doing high-dose opioid anesthetic for hearts. And again, the induction dose was 60 milliliters of 50 mics per milliliter um, fentanyl. So if you think about how much fentanyl um, we were using, uh, it was really incredible. It was like 3,000 micrograms. Also for induction, and we sometimes would use 100 milliliters of that fentanyl, so 5,000 milligrams for induction. Other things to think about uh, were that in the olden days, I'm going to call it, we also would use sufentanil as a, an infusion. Now when we try to fast track greatly reduce the amount of medication that they these patients receive, then often the patients are extubated within several hours after coming off of bypass and, and getting into the unit. In terms of opioids and benzodiazepines for induction, we way underdose fentanyl now. 20 milliliters is an average range. Some people will use five, some people 10, some 15, 20. Midazolam, also five to 10 milliliters. After induction, the medications would be titrated to effect. Um, every surgical, surgical group will have an antibiotic um, coverage routine. They may give two grams of ANSEF after line placement if the patient is not allergic to penicillin, if they are allergic to penicillin, then it would be vancomycin. They may also, they being the surgeon, may also request that you have Amacar in the room. A 10 gram minimum is what you are going to find um, with some of the surgical groups. Later when preparing for termination of bypass, you're going to draw up protamine to reverse the heparin. The MD is going, and this is the cardiovascular surgeon, is going to tell you the exact amount. And then you're going to administer this. If you administer it, you would place it in a small IV infusion bag and give that slowly as an IV piggyback medication. Sometimes the surgeon wants to give it, and if they do, you, you squirt that sterilely um, in a basin and then they would draw it up and give it intra um, aortic. Now the goals of course for these types of surgery are going to be to maintain myocardial oxygen supply and reduce the demand. Very important. We also want to make sure that we maintain adequate anesthetic depth. 
Also maintain hemodynamics to ensure that organ perfusion is going to continue during induction and then pre and post cardiopulmonary bypass. We want to also help facilitate safe initiation, maintenance, and termination from bypass itself. Now, effects of some of our medications can be quite severe. We've talked about that volatile anesthetics are coronary vasodilators. This may not be a good thing for some patients, and their effect on coronary blood flow is really variable due to the following properties of volatiles. They do produce direct vasodilatation, they do reduce myocardial metabolic requirements, and they do affect the arterial blood pressure. They do appear to have beneficial effects in patients that have myocardial ischemia and MI. We know, for example, that sevoflurane administration pre or post bypass lowers the incidence of MI than if we used propofol alone. We also know that volatile anesthetics will um, exert a protective effect on the heart independent of alterations in the oxygen supply demand ratio. This is called anesthetic preconditioning. For example, sevoflurane and desferane, there's lower levels of cardiac enzymes in, when this was used than propofol in cabbage patients. So when propofol alone was used versus sevoflurane or desferane in addition to the propofol, then um, they had higher levels um, in, uh, of cardiac enzymes in their cabbage patients. When there was a combination of these medications used, then they had lower levels of cardiac enzymes than using propofol alone. Now, volatile agents reduce our myocardial oxygen consumption and are protective against reperfusion injury. Effects may also be mediated by activation of our ATPS potassium pumps, ATPA-sensitive potassium channels. Now we will talk about ischemic preconditioning in the heart. And actually what we're talking about is an intrinsic process within the heart where repeated short episodes of ischemia, and we're talking about less than five minute periods, protect the myocardium against a subsequent ischemic insult. And again, think about this is that this is the heart's protective measure that is you know, already in place to try to protect our hearts if we are to um, undergo another ischemic event such as a myocardial infarction. So here's what happens. If the blood supply to the heart is impaired for a short time, then restored so that the blood flow is then resumed, and then it's repeated two or more times in this process. Then what happens, what, when, the, when it's been studied, what they have found, scientists have found, is that the cells downstream are very robustly protected from a final ischemic insult where the blood supply is cut off entirely and permanently, as it would be if patients were to undergo a myocardial infarction. Now, in this intrinsic ischemic preconditioning, there are two phases, early and late. In early preconditioning, you will see that it occurs in the first four to six hours, and it's thought to be stimulated by the action in the tissue where it's affected, so local action of adenosine, endogenous opiates, and bradykinin, which are also released by these ischemic cells. The presence of each substance is not required, but the protection is, is much more potent if these substances are there. So then, again, adenosine, endorphins, and bradykinin. Um, they activate G protein couple pathways, which also carry a protective signal to an end effector in the sarcolemma. And then what happens is, um, ATP-sensitive potassium channels 
the mitochondrial ATP sensitive potassium channels and the mito mitochondrial permeability transition pore are all activated. Now, in late preconditioning, which is the second phase, it begins at 24 hours and it lasts up to 72 hours after the ischemic and reperfusion uh, stimulus. So let's talk about anesthetic preconditioning. We know that myocardial infarction really is the most serious perioperative complication. So naturally, anesthesia providers would like to do anything to reduce the risk. Um, so for the last 20 years, researchers have been looking into this whole phenomenon of the intrinsic cardiac preconditioning. What they've come up with is anesthetic induced preconditioning, um, which mimics that of this ischemic preconditioning. And both of these processes, whether it's anesthetic induced or the intrinsic ischemic induced preconditioning, share many of the same steps, including the activation of the G-coupled, protein coupled receptor uh, pathways. The, also the multiple uh, protein kinases release, and also the activation of these ATP sensitive pota uh, potassium channels. Now, anesthetic preconditioning is divided into two separate phases, initiated by the same event again, just like we saw in the intrinsic process. Um, and if you recall, the early preconditioning um, that we talked about before with the intrinsic process really begins um, almost uh, immediately. And it occurs though in the first four to six hours. With anesthetic preconditioning, it actually is seen in the first one to two hours after an ischemic episode. And again, it lasts four to six hours, which is probably the exact same as what we see in the intrinsic process. And then again, the second phase depends on the synthesis of enzymes. It, like what we saw in the ischemic preconditioning, begins at 24 to 72 hours and is dependent, as we said, on the ATP sensitive mitochondrial potassium channels. The second mechanism is really essential to anesthetic uh, agents and their ability to enhance ischemic preconditioning and or provide a myocardial protection of some sort. So let's talk about this. Volatile anesthetics and our opioids effectively elicit a pharmacologic preconditioning. And so the volatile anesthetics prime the activation of the sarcolemma and the and mitochondrial potassium ATP channels. And these, um, which we know are, are really the crucial parts, it's the supposed they are the supposed end effectors of preconditioning. And the way they do this, how they activate this, is by stimulation of adenosine receptors and then the subsequent activation of, again, protein kinase. Also, it increases formation of nitric oxide and free oxygen radicals. With the use of desferane, Alpha and beta adrenergic receptor stimulation may also contribute to this preconditioning. Uh, similarly, opiates activate delta and chi opioid receptors, which also lead to this protein kinase C activation. And just talking about what this protein kinase C actually is, it acts as an amplifier of the preconditioning stimulus and stabilizes through a process of phosphorylation, the open state to the mitochondrial potassium ATP channels and the sarcolemal um, potassium ATP channels. And so again, by opening this, that whole process, 
um, then elicits cytoprotection or this natural protection by the cell. So the take home message is that our volatile anesthetic agents can be used to aid in this pharmacological preconditioning, which really enhances the intrinsic ischemic preconditioning that we talked about. Although pre and post conditioning effects on these cardiomyocytes are crucial for this cardioprotective effect of the volatile anesthetics to occur, their influence on the coronary endothelium really has been found to, to possibly be even more beneficial uh, and more important for the improvement of long-term prognosis in patients that are undergoing a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So universal improved outcomes after volatile anesthetic administration um, <clears throat> in non-cardiac surgical patients at risk of perioperative MI has not been seen. Okay, so these patients who are at risk but they're non-cardiac surgical patients really haven't benefited uh, patients uh, in any way in terms of this anesthetic preconditioning. But again, with volatile anesthetics, we, got, we need to be thinking about what they actually provide uh, in terms, what are their pharmacologic capabilities in, in terms of what they provide to patients. If you recall, I mentioned that years ago, before we went to fast tracking, it was thought that any type of volatile anesthetic for heart patients was really very, very detrimental to their long-term survival and, uh, and actually detrimental to them while under anesthesia for having cardiac surgery. Well, we know that that now is not true because there are volatile anesthetics that are on the pump, the cardiopulmonary bypass pump, and we have less of a reliance on the high dose opiates that we used to give for induction and, and that carried us throughout the entire procedure. So volatile anesthetics decrease preload and afterload and they can be potentially beneficial in patients with heart failure because of that. Also volatile anesthetics depress contractility. They all prolong the QT interval, but sevoflurane really needs to be avoided in patients that have a long QT syndrome because it seems to have the greatest impact on this. Now I want to talk about some specific actions of certain volatile agents. Some studies suggest that volatiles, especially sevoflurane, reduces the inflammatory response to ischemia, reperfusion, and other pro-inflammatory stimuli. Halothane and isoflurane are said to be the greatest myocardial depressants. Halothane, even though we don't use it here in the United States, primarily affects large coronary vessels, while forane affects the smaller vessels. There's also a dose-dependent abolition of autoregulation, um, which may be the greatest, it occurs in all of them, with forane. And then desferane and isoflurane decrease blood pressure equally. It's also been said, and this is controversial, that desferane decreases um, SVR the most. But we do know that vasodilatation from desferane um, autonomically is autonomically mediated, while with sevoflurane, there's less coronary vasodilatating properties. So when we were talking earlier about why, another reason why volatile anesthetics were not used for heart surgery for many, many years, um, one of the reasons was a concern of a phenomenon or syndrome called coronary steel or cardiac steel syndrome. Remember, coronary steel or cardiac steel syndrome, one of those two, two um, names will be what I will be asking for when I ask you a question about this. 
And basically what coronary steel is, is it's a condition that's characterized by shunting of all relatively well oxygenated blood from a critical area of low perfusion to an area of higher perfusion. This causes a fall in blood flow to the subendocardium that is distal to the stenosed coronary artery. So it's been suggested that volatile anesthetics may actually cause a coronary steel phenomenon, especially isoflurane. So again, back to what I said, heart surgery was done without using volatile anesthetics. Instead, we used a high-dose opioid-based <clears throat> induction and maintenance until 90, 1995 or, or later, and it was because of this thought. Um, but again, there's lack of evidence for the theory that any of these agents actually cause this coronary steel phenomenon. Also, we know that um, coronary uh, steel, when it occurs, um, it's usually because of uh, a certain type of vasodilators, vasodilators have been given. Now, another example of steel, not what we're talking about with coronary steel, but an, another example of steel is subclavian steel. And this is seen in vascular patients, okay? Subclavian steel is seen in vascular patients where the arm steals blood from the brain. And what happens is the person feels giddiness during arm exercise. Now, this whole steel phenomenon occurs when there's an obstruction to one vessel, which is connected to another. So we're talking about subclavian steel, and subclavian steel occurs in vascular patients where the arm steals blood from the brain so that the person feels giddiness, because again, lack of oxygenation and blood flow to that area during arm exercise. Next, I want to talk about the effects of our induction agents. And when I'm talking about induction agents, I'm not just talking about propofol and atomidate. I'm also talking about ketamine, midazolam, and then large doses of fentanyl. Nearly all of these will increase heart rate as a result of the decrease in blood pressure and SVR. So these agents, what I mean is these agents are not causing the increase in heart rate. It is a compensatory mechanism of the heart that is going into effect as a result of the decrease in blood pressure and SVR that occurs with these induction agents. The exception, of course, would be ketamine because it doesn't normally decrease the blood pressure and the, and the SVR. We know that this is a, extremely important that we pay attention to the effects of our induction agents because patients that have poor left ventricular function and many of the ones coming for uh, coronary artery bypass grafts do have poor left ventricular function, may not be able to tolerate even a small amount of myocardial depression. So we really need to, to take induction and the use of our uh, induction agents very seriously. Propofol and midazolam do decrease cardiac output and cardiac index, although usually it's transient. And we're talking about midazolam when used as an induction agent. Of the agents that we use, Atomidate has little change on the cardiac output and index, but with proper use, Propofol uh, also will not drop it enough to, to really cause uh, problems for the patient. Let's look at the effects of opioids, and we're using that as adjunct agents, not as induction agents. All except meperidine will decrease the heart rate by centrally mediated vagolytic effects. Also, the decreased heart rate will result in a decreased oxygen demand, which can be beneficial. Morphine has a reflexive increase in heart rate due to the release of histamine. And then <clears throat> with histamine, there's a decreased blood pressure. They decrease sympathetic tone, which in turn decreases preload and afterload. And rapid administration of 
larger doses of opioids may cause bradycardia and what we have referred to in the past in some of our lectures as bored chest. And what that means is that it is extremely difficult. The, the, the chest is very stiff. And so and until uh, there's some muscle relaxation given uh, or the effect of the opioid is wearing off just a bit, this bored chest effect, it's very difficult to get a breath in. So that's what we refer to as bored chest. So before we actually talk about the sequence of events, I want to talk about our muscle relaxants. Our muscle relaxants really uh, don't have much of an effect on the heart. Um, the only ones being is that we know that uh, pancuronium, pavulon, does cause an increase in heart rate, which in this case, especially when we were using large doses of opiates for induction, really was beneficial for us to use, and, and we use it for maintenance also, it was beneficial to use pancuronium because that offset the bradycardia induced from the large doses of opiates. In addition, vecuronium, which is very cardiovascularly stable, doesn't produce any type of uh, effect on heart rate. But if you give large doses of fentanyl, as we used to in, in the in the past and you use vecuronium, then you weren't going to get that increase in heart rate that maybe was needed to offset the decrease from the uh, opiates. So now we'll talk just a bit about uh, the sequence of events. Usually the patients who come in for surgery and are inpatients will have been prescribed a pre-medication. Sometimes it's morphine, uh, midazolam, and scopolamine. The outpatients <clears throat> usually do not have a pre-med that's prescribed, and so the anesthesia provider is going to give that to the patient as they're being brought back to the room. So the patients are, are interviewed if they are inpatient or outpatient. They've already been seen if they're inpatient um, the day before um, or previous, um, you know, before surgery. And the outpatients may not be seen until the day of surgery, although they may have been interviewed prior to that. So regardless of where they are, they're going to again be interviewed um, and assessed and then taken to the OR where the monitors are placed and we are going to give them oxygen by nasal cannula. Now, as I mentioned, if they are an outpatient, we need to give provide some sedation. If they are an inpatient, they have usually already received a pre-medication. But that doesn't mean that if they need more, if they're very anxious, that we wouldn't give more. So the purpose of bringing them to the OR is, of course, to prepare them for induction and to place additional lines. They do need two large bore IVs. Sometimes this can be accomplished in the holding areas, whether outpatient or inpatient, an arterial line, and a PA catheter. Generally, the IVs and the arterial lines can be placed in these outpatient or inpatient holding areas, but not always. And we know that the PA catheter is generally going to be placed in the room. And so we will place these lines. If they have not been placed, all of these are going to be placed in the OR. We normally will use the left arm for an arterial line unless it's contraindicated for some reason. Then after the PA catheter is placed, we will pre-oxygenate the patient with an oxygen mask from our circuit. So we take off the nasal cannula, put on our mask as we would and prepare for induction and intubation. So when we then are going to do the induction, we would give our, uh, our pre-medication if we were going to give some. Um, we know that the, outpatient, the inpatients have already had some, so we might give some fentanyl, more fentanyl, more midazolam, and then <clears throat> our induction agent propofol in this case, 
We can use succinylcholine if we want to secure the airway. We could use rocuronium if we want to secure the airway. Um, or we could do a non-depolarizer induction with a you know, more intermediate acting medication such as vecuronium. So we're going to give our uh, induction agent and then depending on when or what agent we're going to use in terms of muscle relaxant, we would go ahead and administer that appropriately. If you're going to do a non-depolarizer um, induction with vecuronium, then you need to uh, allow more time for pre-oxygen, I mean for mask management of that airway. After you have intubated and secured the breathing tube, you are going to make sure, if you haven't done it already, that you've lubed, taped, and padded the eyes. You're going to place an OG tube unless a transesophageal echo is to be done. If a transesophageal echo is to be done, then you wait until after the surgery before transport to place your OG tube. After induction, you want to stabilize the hemodynamics for the patient. And this is all before bypass. And so we're going to start vasoactive drips if necessary. Usually we would start nitroglycerin at 33 mics per minute or other drips as indicated by the surgeon. Some want you to start Amicar and there are different protocols based on surgical preference and that's also institution and surgeon specific. Then we need to think about labs, obtain a baseline ABG and an ACT, activated clotting time. We will be tucking and patting the arms and placing an ether screen. Now, when we pad the arms, that means that we want to pad with four by fours, um, all the extensions that we've placed on our IV are A-line so they don't dig into the patient's skin. And the ether screen, there are uh, handles, holders on each side. The ether screen is usually just a bar that goes in those uh, holders on each side and it tilts back and then the drape comes up over that and clips to that so that it, it's another protection and holds that screen up uh, away, you know, but it still protects the surgical site, uh, but it also is placed up so that instruments and those kind of things are not placed on the patient's face, etc. We also um, are going to titrate our opiates, our gas for skin incision, because again, we have to, you know, they're going to come in and work very quickly. Usually leg incision is going to be made when they are, if they're going to use the leg to harvest veins for bypass grafts. So we need to be paying attention and make note of when skin incision was made and then also be prepared for sternotomy. So we want to watch the surgeon carefully. Sometimes they can come in and be ready for sternotomy in less than three minutes. And so usually the surgeon, not always, but usually the surgeon is going to say that he's testing the sternal saw. What that means to you is that you need to be, need to be paying attention because as soon as he gets ready to, to cut the sternum, you need to, to stop ventilation and put the lungs down so that he doesn't cut through those lungs. I want to talk for just a minute about sternotomy. Sternotomy is an extremely painful stimulus. And as I mentioned, usually the sternal saw is tested and they'll buzz it. That's what they do to test it. But be prepared to drop the lungs without being told. Really for safety, every cardiovascular surgeon who or anyone who's going to use the sternal saw really should say testing the saw and then audibly test it. Um, and then say drop the lungs, but that doesn't always happen, happen so please be prepared to do so. Now, there, there is an occasion when you would not drop the lungs with sternotomy, and this is in the case of a redo sternotomy. 
you would not drop the lungs because a different type of saw is used. It's an oscill oscillating saw. And the reason it's done is that after you've had the initial sternotomy, uh, and if it's been by bypass grafts um, or valve replacement or otherwise, there's still some adhesions um, and uh, some, especially with the pericardium. And so cutting through, you actually want the, the lungs to stay as expanded because that helps <clears throat> with cutting through so that you, uh, with that particular saw, um, and so you don't cut through the uh, pericardium or inadvertently cut a vessel. But you do wanna have blood in the room prior to incision in case something does occur. After stenotomy, the sternum is going to be spread with retractors, and these are all events that will be occurring on the surgical field. So you need to be able to stand there and, and look to see what's happening and be paying attention periodically during, throughout the procedure. Then they will use a chest wall elevator, which usually is placed on the left side of the sternum and is going to elevate that side. And the reason is that they are going to, the surgeon is going to be, begin taking down the left internal mammary artery to be used for a, a graft. The leg veins, as I mentioned before, have usually, the harvest has already been started. Um, <clears throat> it's, it, that, that incision, the leg incisions are usually done before chest incision and usually are started by the PA. Um, if there's an assisting uh, cardiovascular surgeon, then he or she may have begun that incision as well. The surgeon is going to tell you when to give heparin, and we want to give that through a central line to make sure that it has, that it is uh, going to be uh, absorbed into the system quickly. Now, the next thing is heparinization and the dose. It usually will vary between 3.5 to 4 milligrams per kilogram. Some have standardized it to just be 4 milligrams per kilogram, this initial dose. And remember that one milligram of heparin equals 100 units of heparin. After you have given, you've calculated the dose and you have given the heparin, usually the heparin comes in 10,000 units per milliliter, 10,000 units per milliliter, even though one milligram equals 100 units. Okay, so you're going to advise the surgeon when the heparin has infused. And usually you say heparin's in, and then you're going to say, uh, uh, usually wait three to five minutes and say, you know, it's been three minutes. You should anticipate a transient drop in blood pressure due to the uh, anticoagulation or actually the decrease in viscosity if you want to think about it that way. Heparin binds to antithrombin 3 and it catalyzes the inhibition of thrombin. Okay, so what we want to do is to check the activated um, clotting time. So we've done our initial one to see what our baseline was, and then we're going to repeat the ACT after we have given the heparin, and it's been in three to five minutes, and each place will have its own policy for that. And then what we want to see is that, it, that the ACT is greater than 450 seconds. The normal activated clotting time is 100 to 140 seconds. For non-cardiac surgery, um, they may accept a lower limit. It may be 250 to 300 sec seconds would be acceptable. But for cardiopulmonary bypass, greater than 450 seconds has to be. And if it's right on the verge of being 450, then generally, you will be asked to administer additional heparin so that, that it can be elevated above that 450 mark. Now, while the patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass, the individual who, be, who will be checking labs and of course also the ACT is the perfusionist. And then he will ad adjust the dose of heparinization 
um, in the pump and, and that kind of thing accordingly. The next events that will occur will be aortic cannulation <clears throat> and then venous cannulation. So let's talk about aortic cannulation first. Catecholamines are, will be released when the pericardium is cut. So what you can expect is for patients, you may see a brief episode of hypertension. Now, surgeons have specific parameters where they would like for the blood pressure to be for cannulation. Some want it around 100 <clears throat> systolic, others want it less than that, so they will usually tell you. <clears throat> so things to do definitely is to keep a tight control of it prior, your blood pressure prior to, with drips, you know, your anesthetic agents, etc. But you may also have to manipulate the bed, which may be that you'd say, put, I'm going to raise the head of the bed. We know that's going to decrease the blood pressure. And then, as I said, adjust your drips, sedation, your volatile anesthetics, et cetera. You do want to protect the eyes. And of course, all of us now have to do that anyway. But just know that sometimes um, blood can spurt over, uh, over across the drape uh, into your area. Next is venous cannulation. And so, again, this venous cannula is going to be placed in the right atrial appendage. What can happen is that you may see some dysrhythmias. It may be very poorly tolerated by patients who are dependent on having a sinus rhythm because you've lost your atrial kick um, when, this dys uh, when these dysrhythmias occur. And then cardiopulmonary bypass will commence once the cannula is in place and the ACT is acceptable, which we said is greater than 450 seconds. Now, again, we have to be thinking about, they're gonna roll the pump, and so what they're, what they're trying to do is it's taking over from the patient's control of circulation to the pump control circulation. And so once they establish, and this is they the perfusionist, once full flow, has been established on the pump, the perfusionist will say full flow, and that is when we cease ventilation. And the way that we do that is by taking, <clears throat> turning off the ventilator onto manual, also taking the bag off and then putting it over the ventilator arm. That's a, usually a sign to let you know that you have to resume it. And then occasionally uh, also opening up the, because sometimes the lungs, when you stop ventilation, are going to be fully expanded. And so to flatten those, you want to take it, the elbow, off of your endotracheal tube, to the top of your endotracheal tube, to make sure that the lungs go down, and then you can put it back on there. Of course, you want to have your oxygen off, all your gas off. Um, your pulse oximeter off because none of those things are going to be really workable during that time. You, the inhalation agent is going to be used by the perfusionist on the pump, but that's to their discretion. So again, all the things that, that we were using, our oxygen, our inhalational agent, um, the ventilator, uh, et cetera, will be turned off. Other things that we would need to do, the CRNA would need to do, once the patient is actually on pump, full flow has been established, we've stopped the pulse oximeter, we turn off the inhalational agent and turned off the oxygen. <clears throat> and, and as I said, um, lungs are deflated. Uh, and ventilator with the bag, the ventilator bag is, is across the arm of the ventilator. We may have to pull the PA catheter back two to five centimeters if it's wedged, and the surgeon would tell you, tell you that. It really depends on the length that it's inserted. Also, we are you, as the provider, will observe the heart activity. Um, you're going to empty the Foley, record, and tell the perfusionist what the urine output was, and that would be your pre-pump total. So there's a note for you to make in your record as well. Next, we have to be thinking about the aortic cross clamp is going to come on and eventually the heart is going to cease beating. Okay, so cardioplegia is being given 
and we're going to talk a bit about that, um, through the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And there's going to be the aortic cross clamp that's going to be placed, and there'll be actually ice placed on the heart itself. So once the aortic cross clamp is placed, you want to turn off your nitroglycerin. Remember, in the background, the nitroglycerin has usually been infusing at 33 mics per kilogram per minute or whatever dose is, is uh, what has been set by usually the protocol. And any other vasoactive drips, turn those off. And as I mentioned, the, per the pulse oximeter will also be turned off. In addition, oxygen is going to be down to the lowest flow possible. We know that there is some that circulates through the anesthesia machine at, at, uh, at all times, but we're going to turn it down to the lowest possible that we can get it. Then after you've given the pre-pump total of urine, you're going to empty the Foley every 30 minutes and notify the perfusionist of the amount. Remember, we want to make sure that it is at least one milliliter per kilogram per hour, so you need to you know, tell the perfusionist and then also say to the surgeon, this is less than one milliliter per kilogram per hour. There is usually a protocol for antibiotics. Uh, in some instances, it's going to be every four hours. In some, it might be every six. During this time, we're going to monitor train of four. Remember, patients are going to be cold. Their temperature is going to be decreased. And so, their metabolism is also decreased, but we're still going to monitor our train of four and dose the muscle relaxant as needed. Generally, what many people uh, did in the practices where I've worked and done hearts is, <clears throat> you know, I would always give my medications to the perfusionist to give on the pump. You can still give them if you want to you know, through your uh, central lines. Um, but I thought, always found it easier to give my medica give the medications to the perfusionist and tell them how much I wanted them to give. A, a com communication with the perfusionist is really essential um, for labs, you know, for opioids, for midazolam, for any, you know, muscle relaxant, any type of needs. And so you're going to be doing a lot of communication during that time, certainly talking to them about the urine output and that kind of stuff. What you will do is going, you're going to continue to monitor mean arterial pressure. Now on EPIC, that's already changed, but if you are, are working in a place where they still have a paper record, then you would mark an X every five minutes with the mean arterial pressure. So, as I said, patients are cooled. And the reason it's necessary is that the objective is to decrease the basal metabolic requirements of the heart because that's going to protect the heart during a rest. Usually patients are going to be cooled to 20 to 28 degrees um, and this lower temperature allows the autoregulation curve to shift to a low of about 30 mean arterial pressure instead of the normal 50 to 60 mean arterial pressure. And again, all that is determined by protocol. Some don't want the mean arterial pressure to be below this or above that. And so some have very strict limits that are given, given and will be included in that protocol as well as the temperature, um, how low the patients will actually be cooled. Also, something to remember is that there is a loss of pulsatile flow. Um, there's also, as we talked about, hemodilution um, that has occurred with the heparin, and also hemodilution with the priming volume leads to a lower viscosity, and this is what's happening uh, on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine with, with, with the uh, medications and fluids that are going through that machine. Your CVP and your PA numbers should decrease. Now, if we see an elevation on our monitors, then that could indicate obstruction to drainage or flow. Some surgeons will use the PA pressure line to monitor retrograde pressures. And if that happens, they will throw a sterile It'll be on their field and they will throw you a pressure line. You will attach it to the stopcock of your PA pressure line and then we'll 
adjust it, turn it so that it is monitoring those retrograde pressures. With cardioplegia, the goal is to rest the heart while continuing to provide nutrients to it. The initiation of cardioplegia is going to change the ECG. What you will see is an ST segment elevation, a widening of the QRS, bradycardia, and finally electrical silence. Now, continued activity of the heart indicates several things in their problems. An inadequate composition of the cardioplegia, an inadequate volume, or delivery of cardioplegia. What we need to do now while the surgeon is sewing is to observe. Keep up with his progress, the surgeon. Many of the surgeons like for you, the CRNA and or the student to be enthusiastic about what they do. In other words, paying attention, but also doing what you need to be doing. You want to hook up the line to your largest, the volume line, because you will be giving volume from the cardiopulmonary bypass machine to your largest IV, and it can be peripheral or central. Now, you're not going to have this right away, uh, the volume from the pump. And again, most of the time, we have turned our infusions because our purpose is not to overhydrate the, pa the patient during bypass. We've turned that to a KVO rate. Um, and, and essentially, you know, almost off, but you want it KVO so that it doesn't clot off. You will then prepare con your continuous um, cardiac output, cardiac, cardiac index monitor for manual operation. Calculate your inotropic drugs. What that means is you want to calculate what rate, what rate in mics per kilogram per minute for that particular patient. Certain drugs will be epinephrine, which is done in many institutions, calculated as mics per, per minute and given in mics per minute instead of mics per kilogram per minute. So if that's how it is, and you would calculate that in mics per minute. If there's a medication such as dopamine, which is still mics per kilogram per minute, or dobutamine, which is mics per kilogram per minute, then you would calculate that and what you're looking for is how we've done it with medication calculations. You want to know how much in one milliliter there is of mics per kilograms per minute for that individual patient. And the reason is that if they said start this drip at five mics per kilogram per minute, you would be able to have that started quickly. You also want to um, calculate all medications that you would be using, um, be anticipating uh, what you would give your, for your protamine for reversal of the heparinization, and make sure that your chart, particularly if it's a paper chart, that you're keeping that up to date. Remember, you're, with your EPIC, the vital signs are going to continue to be recorded in the background, but you want to make sure that you've actually uh, that you are continuing to record on your on your record. Next, at some point um, after the bypass um, graphs have been placed, um, then we are going to the, the surgeon is going to say, "I want to start rewarming." So this is the time that if you were giving midazolam, opioids, and muscle relaxant, that these would need to be redosed. And whether you give them or the perfusion gives them, it doesn't really matter, but remember that this is the time to do it. The aortic cross clamp is going to be removed. And once it's removed, you would restart the nitroglycerin drip as ordered by the surgeon if that is in their protocol. Um, remember that the heart may need to be defibrillated once the cross clamp is removed and it you know in order for it to start really beating appropriately you want to have calcium chloride in the VIP the central line part and be prepared to give calcium 500 to a gram of calcium as ordered by the surgeon and then remember the patient is going to be rewarmed to approximately 36 degrees and so all these things you know, will be, you need to be paying attention, but you are going to be um, given instruction for these things.
The next is we want to resume ventilation. The lungs have been deflated for a period of time and they're flat. So it is prudent for the sRNA and CRNA to begin with manual, manual ventilation where you're actually watching the lungs as they expand. And once they've expanded, you can resume your mechanical ventilation. Some surgeons will request that the lungs be suctioned prior to ventilation, so that's something to think about also. Now, separation from cardiopulmonary bypass and decannulation. Once the cannulas are removed and the holes where they were um, are closed, the surgeon is going to in instruct the CRNA, sRNA to give protamine. Obviously, you wouldn't want it uh, give protamine when the cannulas are in place because it could form clots around those areas. Now, the reversal of heparin is accomplished through protamine, and protamine is a highly alkaline polycationic protein that's derived from salmon sperm. It binds and neutralizes heparin, which is anionic, and remember, one milligram of protamine is going to bind 100 units of heparin, okay? Now, we need to use it uh, with caution because patients can have anaphylaxis or other allergic reactions. Certainly use caution in patients with a prior reaction to protamine. Uh, patients receiving NPH insulin and those that have an allergy to true fish like vertebrate um, if they have an allergy to any drug, um, we want to use it with caution. And theoretically, you know, some of these are theoretical. And theoretically, anyone who has had a vasectomy, because as we said, it comes from salmon sperm, even though that's just a theoretical um, uh, caution, precaution. Prior exposure to protamine does not necessarily increase the risk of a true allergy to protamine. And, and I'm not talking about the people who've had allergic reactions. I'm talking about if they've had protamine in the past. You do, regardless of it, want to infuse it slowly through uh, an IV. And I put IV piggyback because it needs to be placed in the bag, not pushed. Some surgeons are going to give it from the field. It will be intra-aortic. But if we are giving it through an IV, it needs to be IV piggyback because we are be using cardiotoxic doses to reverse the heparin. The rate of administration here is really more important than the route in preventing reactions. So you're not going to just start it and immediately you know, have it go as fast as possible without seeing some significant decrease in blood pressure and other effects. As we are also separating from bypass, we want to infuse the volume that has come from the pump, um, <clears throat> which is usually some autologous type blood if you want to think about it like that. Um, also lactated ringers if we need it, packed red blood cells as needed. Um, the, the pump from the volume from the pump definitely, um, sometimes we'll need, patients will need packed red cells and other, uh, other uh, blood products such as cryoprecipitate, platelets, FFP, depending on the amount of bleeding. And then we're going to titrate vasoactive drips as needed for blood pressure control. And so that's going to be something that you as the provider does, not that you're going to be told to do it. So that's why you need to be fully prepared and have those calculated and be ready to go. You do want to notify the perfusionist of the final urine. So once bypass has, has come you know, over, uh, and, it, and it's back on you for the intake and output, you will tell them the perfusion at, perfusionist at the end how much urine has been how, has occurred on, uh, on when they've been on bypass. Now, once the protamine has been infused, you will notify the surgeon, wait four minutes or whatever the protocol is, it's three to five, and then draw ABGs and an ACT and notify the surgeon of the result. As I mentioned, there are often pacing wires that are placed um, sterilely for some of these patients. Some surgeons will place both atrial and ventricular wires. Some will just um, place ventricular wires regardless. 
you will have the pacemaker on your side. They will have the sterile uh, cables and they'll toss the cable, the end that goes into the pacemaker over to you. But you want to check to see that, it, that the wires are functioning properly. So again, remember you want that on a demand rate and you want to set the rate to check it for higher than what the patient's intrinsic rate is, okay? And if we need to go over that, please let me know and, and we can if you don't understand that. That's a very, very important concept to know. And then we have to be thinking about when patients come off of bypass. Sometimes it's not always successful. And so some of the predictors that would let us know that maybe the, these patients are going to need some assistance were, were, would be if they had pre-bypass ischemia, if they had prolonged uh, a, a run of cardiopulmonary bypass, if the surgeon was unable to completely bypass some of the areas so they had an incomplete bypass result, if air or particulate coronary emboli uh, happened to, you know, have, have occurred. If there was a large ventriculotomy that was done or an aneurysm resection, which would impact the function of the left ventricle, then all these patients may require some assistance, some circulatory assistance, a balloon pump, a ventricular assist device. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about circulatory assistance. Now, criteria for failure. In other words, failure meaning not being able to come off of cardiopulmonary bypass. If they have filling pressures, and usually we're talking about PA pressures greater than 20, if they have a cardiac index that is less than 1.8, because we know that two is the low limit of normal. If they have a systolic blood pressure with maximum inotropic support that's less than 90 degrees systolic. If they have a heart rate that's greater than 80, and that they have a normal, normal calcium level, which means that giving additional calcium is not going to benefit the patient's heart. So if all these things are in place, or if some of these things are in place, then again, that means generally that patients are not going to successfully be separated for cardiopulmonary, uh, from part cardiopulmonary bypass. So some of the devices that may be needed, as I mentioned, the balloon pump, the ventricular assist device, uh, an impella recover <clears throat> support system. Generally those, you know, you don't see those as much in the OR, but, but that's a possibility. A lot of the things that are placed are really dependent upon the um, skill of the surgeon. Since we've already talked about balloon pumps and ventricular assist devices, um, I'm not going to cover a lot about that in this lecture, but I did want to talk about impellas. Some of you have probably used them before. Um, it was actually this impella recover support system was developed to address the need for ventricular support in patients who develop heart surgery or heart failure after heart surgery and who haven't responded to standard medical um, therapy. In some institutions, you generally see these in the units versus um, the ones coming from the OR with them, but they can certainly be used that way as well. The system does provide immediate support and it restores hemodynamic stability for up to seven days. Um, um, and again, with new developments, it may be used longer as well. Um, the pump can be inserted through a standard catheterization procedure in the OR. It would be you know, different because you already have the openings through the femoral artery into the ascending aorta across the valve and into the left ventricle. And as I said, it could be used as a bridge to longer term therapy. Um, most places, again, if they are able to do VADs and the patient was in that kind of shape, then probably they would move on to that. Um, but it does allow for developing a definitive treatment strategy for the patient. Um, it can provide support for the left side of the heart, 
um, you know, using, and there's a variety of, of devices as well. So you probably, most of you or many of you have probably used these or have had some exposure to them when you worked in critical care. But if you haven't, that's why we're talking about it. Now, the Impella 2.5 will pull blood from the left ventricle through an inlet area near the tip, and then it expels blood from the catheter into the ascending aorta. But, you know, again, there are several models. I have just talked about two, but they actually, uh, there are several. And so uh, both provide immediate support and restore hemodynamic stability. Um, so, you know, again, you know, you may see some of uh, both of these. And of course, we talked about the injury aortic balloon pump and actually the, the principle that it works upon is counter pulsation. Um, we also talked about when it inflates and deflates, it's very important that you understand that. This is a great slide. So if you were asked about uh, when it inflates and when it deflates, you could answer that as well as from our previous lecture when we talked about the um, what happens if it were to inflate or deflate too early, okay, or too late. Um, all, all those kind of things that we talked about are, are important to know. Um, again, you know, the indications for an intraaortic balloon pump is left ventricular failure despite maximal inotropic support and or evidence of ongoing regional myocardial ischemia, and these are for non-surgical candidates. We've talked about this before, too. If we have attempted to come off bypass, to separate from bypass, and patients have not been able to sustain a, a, a blood pressure, so in other words, they failed to come off of bypass, um, then this may be the assistance that they need. Um, and that's, that's what we've been talking about today are patients who are undergoing cardiac surgery. But also patients that are in the cath lab and they have a high grade proximal lesion, um, especially one that supplies large, plus supplies large areas of the myocardium. They also have some persistent ischemia or they have an MI post stent. They may also have a balloon pump placed before coming to cardiac surgery. So we would see them for a variety of reasons. And of course, those patients in the unit. Um, and then a ventricular assist device. We know that there are many generations and many types. Um, this is, I think, a very good graphic here. Uh, we know that some are, what we're talking about are the patients that are having difficulty with ventricular pump failure and coming off bypass. But we've talked about the others. There's also ones who um, need it for destination therapy. This is, is this is what they are going to get. This is as good as it gets for their heart, in other words. Um, and then we know that, again, a ventricular assist device is a battery operated device that's designed to assist either one or both ventricles to pump blood to the body. Um, and again, most of these uh, that we've talked about uh, are going to be for destination therapy too. The battery ones, the battery operated ones, especially that don't have a power plug um, or because of mobility. So, so that's what we're talking about. And also they benefit from it when they can't be patients who can't be weaned from cardiopulmonary bypass after having open heart surgery, those who suffered severe MI, not in surgery, but certainly those patients who've had surgery and then have an intra-op MI uh, will probably be ones that would, would need some support coming off bypass. Myocarditis patients also in the unit uh, maybe uh, have a, a ventricular assist device and then patients who've had a heart transplant and who are rejecting the organ would need a, a ventricular assist device to help as a bridge to transplant for that, to get another transplant. Um, also, I wanna talk about different types of surgical approaches. Now we've talked about the devices and we've talked about open heart surgery. I wanna talk about alternate surgical approaches to open heart surgery. Off pump cab is one, it avoids cardiopulmonary bypass. We'll talk about that. It's also a very busy type of a procedure for the CRNA. Mini sternotomy, it avoids a full sternotomy incision. 
There's also heart pour. The port access for a cabbage is done through a thoracotomy incision, so we're not having the full sternotomy again. But there is cardiopulmonary pulmonary, pulmonary bypass that occurs through uh, the femoral artery and vein. Um, these heart ports were had came in vogue for a while. Um, I don't know that many places that do them now, but uh, I understood just uh, not too long ago that there are places that are still doing it, so that's why I put it back in. Also, laser revascularization and a TAVR. Those are all procedures that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So off pump cabbage and, you know, again, this is, you can see some of these devices here. Um, the heart is beating. So you don't have the cardioplegia. You don't have cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, you don't put ice on the heart and the patient is going to maintain a normal temperature. The heart is going to stay beating and it uses these instruments that you see here called starfish and an octopus to stabilize the beating heart while the grafts are sewn in. Um, position adjustments, and that's head of the bed position adjustments of the patient usually are important um, for the CRNA to, to provide to assist with preload. Also mechanical issues can occur with um, positioning the heart. Uh, for grafting, like they can kink off the IVC and the SVC, and you see with this instrumentation how that's possible. And that's what I've just said here. Now, we also know that what we want to do, as I mentioned, is keep the patients warm. So we would have a heated circuit. We would have a sterile forced air warmer. We would want fluids warmed for the patients. We would want the room temperature increased. Um, and I've been in some rooms doing these where it is quite hot, um, but we want to keep their temperature at a normal temperature for them. We also want to keep them hydrated to maintain a blood pressure. Again, there's going to be limits given by the surgeon, 140 to 150 systolic, um, and also keep them um, hydrated so that they have a, a, a normal preload. Um, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine must be in the room. And again, the case is going to begin the same as uh, an on-pump pump cabbage would be, except the cardiopulmonary bypass machine is in the room only as an emergency backup if we had to crash on pump for something. You will still heparinize the patient as you would for an on-pump cabbage. And again, that's in case you would have to crash onto bypass, which means a be immediately go onto bypass, except the CRNA is going to be the ones drawing the labs and uh, drawing ACTs and keeping up with that every 30 minutes. Remember during uh, an on-pump cab, the, um, or cabbage, the uh, perfusionist was actually keeping up with all this. Now, everything that the perfusionist has been doing over on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, we're doing um, uh, at the head of the bed. Um, the next thing is that we would give protamine um, dosed as usual, and the reason is because we're heparinizing the same. We would monitor vital signs, empty the urine as we would on pump, but we're going to continue doing it. So in other words, we're not handing off at any period of time to another individual, another provider like the perfusionist. We're doing it. So there's no coming off pump. You don't, all the things that we had just discussed about that won't happen because you're doing it all. And it is very busy, as you can imagine, particularly keeping them hydrated um, and uh, so that their blood pressure doesn't drop. Some things to think about. Um, when the surgeon picks up the heart, because again, it's not stopped beating, it's a beating heart. And if you were to put your hand inside a patient's chest and pick up their heart, guess what? their blood pressure is going to drop every time. That's how our heart works. So just anticipate that when the surgeon is doing those types of manipula manipulations, that, that chances are that they are going to have a drop in blood pressure. And so you're going to have to, to uh, make sure, again, that you are keeping them at the uh, requested blood pressure systolic limit and keep them hydrated. The next thing we're going to talk about now, procedure, 
is a transmyocardial revascul revascularization. This is a treatment option for patients that have coronary artery disease that may not be candidates for other treatments. And so, you know, they maybe they have they haven't gotten better with their medications. They um, are not coronary artery bypass graft um, surgery patients. Uh, maybe stenting has not worked for them, and they're really at their last, um, you know, ditch effort here. And so, and they continue to be symptomatic. And so, the target population then for these procedures is going to be. It is a surgical procedure that is aimed at improving blood flow to areas of the heart that in a patient that has an operative inoperable CAD with angina and where other treatments have not helped to relieve their symptoms such as stenting, angioplasty, and medication. And they're also not candidates for cardio, um, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and or uh, cabbage procedures. So what happens is a special carbon dioxide laser is used to actually create small channels in the heart muscle itself, which will in turn improve blood flow in the heart. It's performed through a small left chest or midline incision and the heart continues to beat. Um, it also is usually done, um, a surgeon can do it, cardiologists do it in some, in, in some areas of the country and they determine the number of channels usually 20 to 40 uh, one millimeter channels in the left ventricle they can be performed alone like in a in a cath lab for example or 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 in conjunction with other procedures usually takes if it's done as a single procedure one to two hours and patients are placed under general anesthesia so clinical evidence does suggest that um, improved blood flow um, does occur, uh, can, it can occur in the following ways. The channels will act actually as bloodlines. These channels that are created by the, the laser will act as bloodlines, which will increase the blood flow to the heart. And also when the left ventricle pumps the oxygen rich blood out of the heart, it sends blood through those channels. And so it, it really does help uh, improve blood flow in that way. It reduces pain by, not, this is really not known, but it's thought that it may help, help the growth of tiny new blood vessels or the process of angiogenesis. So the generation of new blood vessels, which would help reduce the pain because there's more blood flow to the area and then of course more oxygen being transported to the area. But they also think that it could be a placebo effect or that the actual laser, the creation of these channels itself, may destroy some of the nerves that have been causing the pain in the heart in the first place. Um, and the results are like this. 80 to 90% of the people who have this feel better than they did prior to surgery. Doesn't mean that they're 100% cured, um, but they do now have a lower risk of having a heart attack and they may be able to take less nitroglycerin and other medications. So at least they get some symptom type of relief. The next procedure that we're going to talk about, alternative to surgery, is a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And with this particular surgery, there's several approaches. Um, there's a trans uh, femoral approach that's approved, um, and then other people uh, use different approaches as well, which the trans apical approach, which we'll talk about. Now, the transfemoral approach requires the use of catheters that are large enough to place the transcatheter aortic valve replacement um, through it. Patients with peripheral artery disease may not have arteries that are large enough to support the transfemoral approach. And so in this case, where they don't, they can't go up through the femoral artery, uh, patients would be evaluated to participate 
in an alternate um, transapical approach. And so, again, if they had the transapical approach, then the incision would need to be made between the ribs. Um, and so what, what usually happens is a compressed tissue heart valve is placed on the balloon catheter and it is made, the, this valve is made of bovine pericardium and it's supported with a metal stent. And so this um, valve is, is placed on the balloon catheter. It's inserted through the ribs in this transapical approach to the apex of the left ventricle and positioned directly inside the diseased aortic valve. Once it's in position, the balloon is inflated to secure the valve in place. And this procedure is performed, as you can imagine, in under general anesthesia in a hybrid operating room. A hybrid operating room is one that could be used for other things. So it could be a procedural room, maybe a, a, with, um, with uh, the ability to do imaging. And so it's set up to do not just straight surgeries, there's also other features such as radiology and those kind of things um, that can do it. Usually a team of imaging and interventional cardiologists and heart surgeons will work together with these and they utilize fluoroscopy and echocardiography to guide the valve to the site of the patient's diseased heart valve itself. Now, during the transaortic procedure, the surgeon is gonna make a J-shaped incision at the top of the sternum in between the manubrium and the body of the sternum itself. And then again, as I said, the heart valve is gonna be placed on the balloon catheter inserted in the aorta and positioned directly inside that diseased aortic valve. Okay, and the same kind of thing. It's the, um, the balloon is then inflated to secure the valve in place. Now I want to move on to transport from the OR to CTSU. And this is not transport for just the patient that had had these alternate surgical um, procedures. This is for transport to the CTSU. So any patient going to the CTSU, and that it can include off-pump cabs, it can include on-pump cabs, um, possibly even TMRs, um, that kind of thing. So basically what happens when um, you are getting ready for transport is we have not dressed the PA catheter site in some instances. I usually put it on, but sometimes you didn't have access to it. So um, you'll place a, a tegaderm or other type of dressing if that's what's used at the institution um, on the PA catheter site. Now, if the patient was going to have a TEE and so they had a pre and a post TEE, and did not get an OG tube as a result, then you're going to insert your OG tube before you transport the patient to the CTSU or CTRU or whatever the unit, the post recovery unit is called, if it's not previously inserted and make sure that you secure it. You're going to remove the eye tape and pads. You will be monitoring them. Some monitors, uh, both from the anesthesia machine and to the transport monitor, will have a brick or module um, from the main monitoring system that inserts into the OR transport monitor. Um, but again, every monitor is different. So if you have to go ahead and, um, you know, and hook it up in a different way, then you do that. But we still are going to be monitoring all the same type of parameters that you monitor during the case still need to be monitored. Blood pressure, EKG, arterial line, PA pressure, et cetera. And then if the patient is intubated, um, and then of course still requires ventilation, and most of them will, um, then you're gonna ventilate with 100% oxygen from their endotracheal tube and the, um, and the uh, AMBU bag. In addition, you're going to make sure that you have emergency drugs that you are taking with you. Lidocaine, ephedrine, um, phenylephrine, and the calcium. You want to make sure that you have those in your pocket ready to go. Um, in addition, you need an additional anesthesia provider 
or if not that, you need some other person. At Wake Med, it used to be that the, um, the, the uh, circulator uh, went with you, um, also the perfusionist, um, but again, that could be different in different institutions. So you need some additional provider to push the IV poles. Sometimes you'll have many IV poles in addition to the people pulling the bed. So you might have two people you know, with the bed, you're doing the airway and obviously you can, if you've got two sets of IV poles with vasoactive drips on them, then you can't be monitoring that. So that's what I mean about extra pair of hands. Then you're going to report to the, um, to the nurse in the CTSU. Uh, of course, give a patient history, their allergies, the meds given, and the time of last dose. They don't necessarily want to know, well, I did general anesthesia because they can tell. So the types of reports that you'd want to say would be that you gave fentanyl, for example, last at so-and-so. Um, the total dose that they got throughout the procedure was this. If they're on vasoactive drips, what vasoactive drips are they on? Um, what was the course uh, in the OR? What was the patient course? So did they have trouble coming off um, of bypass? Did it take several uh, attempts? Did they have to be defibrillated in order to get the heart to stop? Those kind of pertinent, significant things. And then you wanna tell them that you have tested the pacer if it's not in use and that both wires function that you had um, you know, good capture. Sometimes patients are gonna be paced and so they can see, but you still say, yes, we, pace, we check the pacing wires and they are fully functional. You want to tell them what the patient received in terms of um, any type of fluids, whether it is crystalloid or colloid, you wanna make sure that you tell them both. And also their urine output, you want to tell them the ventilator settings that you want the patient to be placed on and any other significant information that you need to know. Again, you, when you go and before you go, you wanna make sure that your equipment, your monitoring equipment and the patient's lines are not twisted around the IV poles like spaghetti, that they are all very, very neatly um, arranged and organized and labeled. It should be that the person that's coming in to take care of the patient knows exactly where everything is without guesswork. And it's really unacceptable to take a patient, to transport a patient in any other condition. That's one of my pet peeves if you can't tell. So next I have um, included a coronary artery disease worksheet. Um, I think I may have to post this in a different way, but the first questions that you will have will be, where does the myocardium receive its blood supply? Those are questions that you would need to answer. And so I think that uh, would be good review for the exam, the questions that I would ask from this section. Name the coronary arteries and their branches. What does the term right dominant mean? What, what does the term left dominant mean when we get to that? What portion of the heart does the right coronary artery supply? What portion does the left coronary artery supply? What about the LAD? What about the circumflex? I want you to name the determinants of coronary perfusion, name the determinants of myocardial oxygen supply and demand. What is um, cor coronary artery disease? What is the pathophysiology of ischemia? Name four known risk factors for the development of coronary artery disease. Discuss stable and unstable angina and include the treatment for each. All these things you're gonna be asked on the exam. What is acute coronary occlusion? Describe the pathogenesis of a perioperative myocardial infarction. What clinical factors increase the risk of a perioperative MI following non-cardiac surgery? What is the importance of a preoperative cardiac assessment? How can cardiac function be evaluated on the history and physical exam? Think about this. Should all cardiac medications be continued throughout the perioperative period? Why or why not? And I really want you to think about this. I want to, you to do some research, do some reading, and answer these questions. Now, if you 
have other questions about the this worksheet, I want you to complete it. And, and again, this is going to be mostly for you, but we will go over, um, I will go over uh, them with you if you have questions, okay? You should all be able to find the, these answers either in the lecture or in your reading. Now, the next few slides we're going to go over are the cardiopulmonary bypass slides. These slides were developed by Tim Settlemeyer, who is a perfusionist. Um, and of course, with our COVID-19 um, and our move to Greensboro, um, we've had, you know, Tim was not able to come and talk to you all um, in person or to record this. So I'm going to include that in the second part of this lecture. So we do know that in terms of cardiopulmonary um, bypass, that really it's a, a technique that um, temporary, temporarily takes over the function of the heart and lungs during surgery. So that circulation of blood and oxygenation and the oxygen content in the blood um, is maintained. The pump itself is often referred to as a heart lung, lung machine or the pump. You'll hear it called various things. But cardiopulmonary bypass pumps are operated by perfusionists and surgically directed by cardiac surgeons who connect the pump to the patient's body through the cannula, cannulas we talked about, the venous and the arterial cannula. It is a form of extracorporeal circulation and we know that cardiopulmonary bypass is commonly used in heart surgery because, again, um, it is difficult, even though now we have off-pump um, cabbage procedures, it is difficult to operate on a beating heart. And so there are some uh, situations, uh, the majority actually now, uh, at least in the current techniques that are used, where cardiopulmonary bypass is used when performing, for the most part, uh, coronary artery bypass graft surgery or aortic, mitral, and other valve replacements or repairs. So operations that require the opening of the any of the chambers of the heart um, requires, of course, the use of a cardiopulmonary bypass machine to support the circulation during that period. And again, as we said, it's important that this is used because it continues to provide nutrients to the blood cells and allows them to continue their own cellular respiration even through the surgery. So it really is a protective thing. Now, in 1931, after witnessing the death of a patient from pulmonary embolectomy, Dr. John Gibbon had an idea for a machine that could take deoxygenated blood and then oxygenate it and pump it back into the arterial system. So he collaborated with his wife, uh, Mary, um, and worked from 1934 to 1942 to develop a extracorporeal circulatory device. By 1942, he had created a device that could keep cats alive um, when, uh, and, and then they also had continued survival after bypass surgery. In 1950, he received support from IBM to build a heart-lung machine on a more sophisticated scale, and then in 1953, <clears throat> he performed his first successful operation on a human. Um, it was an 18-year-old with a large atrial septal defect and a large left-to-right shunt. So beginning with this case, generations of cardiac surgeons from years to come have been able to operate on millions of human hearts with the efficiency and consistency and other things needed so that the patients have a much larger um, uh, incidence of survival. Now, until 1953, cardiac surgery was really in its infancy. And so it was really more of a curiosity um, for treating just uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis. But again, once, once 
people were able, surgeons were trained and people were able to see the benefit of it, it really progressed. So by 1960s, a, uh, the coronary artery bypass graft procedure was being done um, for the most part. By 1970s, there were formal training programs. And in the 1980s, the, um, and, and these formal training programs were not only for perfusionists, but there were periods of time where perfusionists uh, were learning by on-the-job training. Um, and again, surgeons were learning these techniques as well. And then in the 1980s, the cardiopulmonary bypass machines were actually uh, became membrane oxygenators. So the development of cardiopulmonary bypass really revolutionized heart, heart surgery, as you can imagine, because it does function as the heart and the lungs, and it provides systemic perfusion, oxygenation, acid-base balance, temperature control, myocardial protection, and anticoagulation. In addition, the, we know that when bypass is initiated, again, we talked about some of this, the surgeon is going to make the incision, the sternotomy, and do the things we talked about to get to the point where then the patients are ready to go on to cardiopulmonary bypass. So the surgeon places the cardioplegia cannula. Remember we talked about that there would be an aortic cannula that's placed as well as an, an, a venous cannula in the atrial appendage. The perfusionist is then going to reduce the pump flow for clamping of the aorta. You wouldn't want full flow pumping through there um, at a really high pressure because you, know, you could potentially you know, have more issues when trying to cross clamp the aorta. So that happens. And then they resume full flow and check the pressure line. The perfusionist will start the cardioplegia and then also set the temperature um, for you know, maintaining the patient, and we said that patients would need to be cooled. So here is a picture of what the pump looks like. And so you see the vaporizer uh, on the pump, and it used to, as I said, didn't have that on there. You also see some of the various parts, the, the oxygenator, the, um, which, which you're going to go over, and then the perfusionists control all of that. They're going to control the speed of the pump. They're going to control really all the flow and oxygenation through the patient. So it's, it's a pretty sophisticated piece of machinery. Now, the next picture shows the, the cardiopulmonary bypass um, circuit. And so you see the cannulas, the venous and the aortic cannula, and you see the various chambers. Um, there are collection, the, the one, as I said, we do, they do take off some blood, like an autologous type of blood. So some blood is taken off and we give it back to the patient after bypass. So you'll see that, you see the cardioplegia uh, reservoir. And again, the, um, the uh, where they control the speed and that kind of thing of the flow. Now, on the next one, you can see that there are arterial and venous cannulas, which we talked about. There is the cardioplegia delivery line. There is the cardiomyotomy reservoir and filter, the venous reservoir, a roller pump, again, which helps you know roll and keep the, the flow in an established rate, a membrane oxygenation and heat exchanger, and an arterial filter. You can see what those look like that I just talked about. And you see the, the blood in the bag. That's the part that eventually um, is taken off. The one that's on the floor is what I'm talking about. That's the one that's taken off as autologous and is eventually going to be given back to the patient. Now, you also see in terms of the pump speed, and actually what this is, this pump speed helps control the flow. So it regulates the flow. Um, and you see that there, okay? In the
Next one, you see the monitors and the safety systems. And again, you see that it gives ABGs, a hematocrit, hemoglobin, and potassium. Um, and, and I'm sure that some of the other monitors have various other features. But you see it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment. Um, you can also see here that the, um, you see where it is in relation to the OR table. So the assistant, whether that is another surgeon or it's a PA or a nurse practitioner who, or a scrub tech who's assisting the cardiac surgeon generally stands on the left-hand side. The cardiac surgeon generally stands on the right-hand side. Um, once the procedure and they've harvested the grafts and those kind of things. And then the pump is back to the left. Okay. And you can see what it looks like, like there. And so next we'll talk about the aortic and venous cannulation and the diversion of blood. So you see that the right, it goes from the right atrium to the bypass machine and then to the aorta. Again, where all of this is what's happening is that the nutrients that the heart needs um, are provided as well as the oxygenation and the actual flow. And this is a picture of the heart that you can see and what these cannulas actually look like as well as the um, equipment, the chest spreaders and that kind of thing. Now, let's talk about hemodilution. Um, hemodilution uh, again, is uh, there? This is occurring uh, in the pump, so they use a crystalloid circuit prime. Also, there's cardioplegia. We're going to talk about what that is on the next slide and what the makeup of it is. Also, the degree, um, and this initially the hematocrit, you want to keep it 18 to 20 percent when we're talking about hemodilution. So we're talking about degree of hemodilution. And then for you, during your runs, the run time, you want your hematocrit to be around 20%. And then the separation of that varies. Now, in terms of the makeup of the cardioplegia solution, cold cardioplegia can either be crystalloids or blood. Um, Crystalloid-based cardioplegia solutions usually, and you can see here, contain high, contain high concentrations of potassium with variable concentrations of sodium, calcium, and buffer solutions. So they are osmotically balanced fluids. Cold blood cardioplegia is widely used as it can provide oxygen to the myocytes alongside um, its superior buffering and osmotic properties. It is prepared by com combining autologous blood that's taken from the patient from the extracorporeal circuit while the patient is on bypass with a crystalloid solution at different concentrations that also contain buffers and potassium. So it is a well-balanced solution. And again, pat potassium is, um, you know, has 13 milliliters uh, in this one. It's two milliequivalents per milliliter and it's 13 milliliters in that particular one. Next, the, there are positive effects from hemodilution. First of all, there's decreased viscosity, which we know is beneficial. So less chance of an individual clotting and throwing emboli. Um, also, there's increased blood flow because the there is hemodilution, and again, it's less vis uh, viscous fluid. The, there's also a beneficial effects to the myocardium, the renal cortex, the cerebral cortex, and there's reduced blood usage. Now, there are some negative effects as well. Decreased O2 carrying capacity, okay? That's a negative effect because we know that um, that hemoglobin carries our oxygen um, in our blood. And so if we're keeping our um, hemoglobin low, because we know if we have a hematocrit of 20, then chances are that our uh, hemoglobin is probably around six, seven. Also dilution, 
we know can, can affect our coagulation factors and our plasma colloids. Okay, so again, I want you to know the positives. I want you to know the negative effects just from this slide. In addition, hemodilution um, provides a relatively bloodless cardiac surgery. Now, there are new technologies. There's many circuits. There are um, concentrations, um, preparations that are artificial hemoglobin type of concentrations. They've been used in the cath lab and other things. So, so again, those are things that, you know, are some of the newer technology that are coming out. Also, in terms of adequacy of perfusion, a standard flow rate of 2.4 liters per minute um, per meter squared is the standard flow, flow rate. Um, also, you, you can determine um, the adequacy of perfusion by looking at the urine output. If the patient is producing um, adequate urine and there were no other renal issues, then our urine output is going to be a good indicator. Also, their acid um, base balance, their ABGs, the balanced O2 requirements and delivery. So all those things are going to help us to determine the adequacy of perfusion. Now, we do know that before aortic cannulation and cardiopulmonary bypass can be initiated, the patients have to be heparinized. We talked about that. And they generally receive four milligrams per kilogram of heparin. And heparin is required because it potentiates antithrombin-3, it prevents formation of thrombin, and it inhibits factors also 2, 9, 10, and 12. So all of this on this slide you need to know. Why is heparin, heparin required? Um, and we know that because it potentiates um, antithrombin-3 and it prevents formation of thrombin, it also inhibits those factors. Please know that. Also, factors that will affect hepar heparinization will be hemodilution, also hypothermia, extravascular <coughs> depots, in patients who have antithrombin-3 deficiencies that will affect their heparinization. Now, when you're giving heparin for cardiopulmonary bypass, we draw an a, a baseline ACT prior to beginning any heparin, okay? Um, and so we also will administer heparin prior to, to aortic cannulation. Remember, we want to load them with a dose generally around four milligrams per kilogram through their central line. We also want to do the post-administration ACT, which I've spoke to you about, and it must be greater than 450 seconds. We want to make sure that a proper sampling technique is used. And so again, we would not want to draw that with heparinized syringes. Okay, it has to be the proper technique. So let's talk a little.